Now, unfortunately, we've seen this deterioration in breadth and it's sort of across the board. The consumer, it can spend if it wants. It has a lot of savings, but it's a question of confidence. They continue to prioritizing services or continue prioritizing food and drinking places. The consumer will start to face headwinds in our humble opinion. It's going to be difficult to get to that last mile of inflation decline from 3% to 2%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. I am Matt Miller, alongside Damian Sassauer and Gina Martin-Adams. Uh, Tom, John, and Lisa are all in Jackson Hole ahead of our special coverage tomorrow. That could be a serious market-moving event. However, we had a big one last night after the bell. NVIDIA came out with earnings and beat already heightened expectations, even after a more than two 200% rally this year to date. Uh, the stock is moving higher in the pre-market. So uh, a lot of other issues uh, to talk about today, but I think NVIDIA is not only the big market moving issue of um, you know this session, but of this year. What do you think yeah. about it, Gina? Oh, I totally agree. And it's amazing how much NVIDIA continues to beat expectations. There was a lot of nervousness over the summer about this. We started to see flows out of NVIDIA in anticipation of this event, thinking there's no no way they can possibly satisfy analyst expectations, and they blew away expectations. They also seem to have so much cash that they're going to give it back to shareholders. So not only are they beating expectations yes. on the top line, they keep sort of substantiating this theory that this is more than just hype. This is real economic activity. This could be generating a new cycle of growth. And they've got so much cash, they're going to give you a little bit of bump on the side as a shareholder. So there's just nothing bad about this report. Yeah, yeah they offered um, another $25 billion, dollar, uh, authorized another $25 billion dollar buyback. And there were some concerns and still are some concerns about China, right? I mean, the CEO, Jensen Wang, said if we get um, continued uh, narrowed regulation in terms of what we can sell into China, that's going to be a problem for their revenue going forward. Yeah, but I mean, just taking a step back, it's amazing what a blowout quarter for a trillion dollar chip producers can do to market sentiment, right? I mean, it's been an absolutely, I mean, Matt, a brutal, brutal month for financial markets. I mean, I could talk about the real, I could talk about the Korean won, all these currencies that are down three to 4% this month alone. It's been a king dollar story and I'm just along for the ride. I already got a listener uh, and viewer writing in for our listeners out there on radio and our viewers on Bloomberg Television um, writing, why is NVIDIA buying back $25 billion of the stock when it's already up 250% year to date? Do they have no other use yeah. of free cash flow? <laughs> no, I think this is actually really fair because it's the first thing that I thought of, too, is shouldn't there be some investment? Shouldn't there be some reinvestment? But I think that the reality of the situation is there is a lot of reinvestment. There's just so much growth off of AI, so much unexpected cash, what are they going to well, do supply. with it otherwise? They can only invest so much. They've got to certainly amp up supply. I'm really looking forward to talking with our BI team on this later on in the hour. But nonetheless, I do think that this is a really good point and certainly the first thing that came to mind for me as well. Yeah, Thai Semiconductor, can they provide enough equipment so that NVIDIA can keep doing what it's doing? I mean, what a quarter, though. It's me. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, yep. this company, I mean, what, it's doubled its market value to, what, $1.2 trillion in just the last three months? Well, the Crazy. supply issue is one that stands out to me as well, because remember, they don't make their own chips, yeah. right? They still have to outsource that. Right. And um, I guess it, they're getting preferential treatment from TSMC because they seem to have uh, moved $16 billion in the previous quarter. They expect to move more than $16 billion of chips in the next quarter. Um, but yeah, a $25 billion buyback. It's not the only issue affecting markets. We have um, a cr had a crazy ride in yields, right? Yeah. We went up to 434 a couple sessions ago, the highest level since, what, 2007, yeah. and yeah. Uh, then just dropped yesterday as well. How is that affecting the equity markets? No, I think it's been affecting the equity markets for more than a year now, but over the summer, it certainly became a very big issue. Over the last month, very disruptive to broader financial market conditions. Equity markets certainly running in some degree of fear to what's going to happen with yields, but underlying what's happening in yields is this earnings recovery story, and NVIDIA is not the only company 
company that's producing an earnings recovery here. We've got a broad-based earnings recovery in the S&P 500 going on, and that's creating some offset to a lot of fear continuing to emanate out of the bond market. And look, if you're at this point in time, this major critical inflection point in bonds, where suddenly you've moved into a bear market in bonds, that's creating a very different investing climate for equities than we've become accustomed to. For the last 40 years, we've been in a bull market. So there's just going to be these bouts of volatility, some indigestion around the bond market. And that's another experience that we've had over the last month, very consistent with the environment we've well, been in for the last year, year and a half. Well, I mean, you just have to look back and you have to look at what triggered the rise in yields initially, and it was supply issues, right? And we've seen supply yeah. supply this this week alone uh, out of the U.S., but really it's that Euro PMI data. I mean, that's what drove the kind of retrenchment we've now seen in, in European and U.K. yields. And quite frankly, now people are playing for a pause in SEP. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to hear Christine Lagarde, uh, uh -huh. not Jay Powell, out of Jackson Hole and see how she responds to some of the recent data out of the Eurozone. We also had a couple of deaths yesterday. Um, reportedly, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin died in a plane mm -hmm. crash, and we're going to talk about that with a number of uh, uh, experts today on international politics. But I think much more sadly, um, we, we lost yesterday Laszlo Barini, who yeah. was a giant uh, in the markets. He was a a big uh, good friend of Bloomberg as well, but he kind of invented money flow yep. analysis, which is something that, you know, we were, we've we been doing for the last 20 years. Right. Yeah, and a legendary market technician really sort of broke it down to brass tacks of supply and demand. You know, we get all captivated by what's happening with the fundamentals and predicting where the economy is going, but in the reality of things, supply and demand is everything for yep. asset prices. And he continuously sort of brought us back to that reality of, if there's an accelerating demand on a restriction in supply, that's going to have an impact of prices going higher. And this has been one of the key characteristics that's driven the equity market, not only for the last couple of years, but for the last decade and change that many people tend to ignore as we get captivated by the macro, scared by what's happening in bonds, you know, uh, concerned about inflation dynamics. If you just follow the flows, you can actually do quite well as an investor. He taught us that. And it's just something to keep in the back of your head, back of your mind as you're approaching the markets. Well, we also had some interesting watching last night, did we not? I think there was something on Fox. Uh, oh, good point. Oh, yeah. Yes. Wasn't there a Republican <laughs> debate, you know, or something along those lines? Yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I'm interested to hear what AMH uh, has to say about that. I'm interested to hear what Libby Cantrell has to say about that. I mean, it's pretty interesting, um, quite frankly, the fact that Donald Trump wasn't there, but he may have come across as the winner out of last night. I mean, who knows? Yeah, I, exactly. A Republican debate without Donald Trump, I think, is far less interesting. <laughs> Um, uh, nonetheless, I'm sure a lot of people tuned in on Fox News yesterday to watch uh, the also-rans, I guess, vie for second place. Um, let's take a look at what's going on in terms of the markets. Uh, I think it's really interesting to talk about Laszlo Barini because he made such prescient calls. Um, you know, at the end of the 90s, he called the Internet the burst of the Internet bubble. And then he called right before March 9th, 2009, uh, again in the S&P. At, at that point, we were, I think, 660. Today we're trading at 4,468, so quite a bit uh, higher than th those lows, up about half a percent. That's the futures that we're looking at here. U.S. Uh, a dollar, euro dollar right now at 108.52. I think yesterday Tom said we're on 107 watch, so we're still a couple of cents away from that, um, uh, two and a half to be exact. But we're coming down a little bit today, and of course Jackson Hole is going to have a huge impact on what we see there, as well as the rates. Very interesting level at 420 right now on the 10 year uh, 41978 to go out five significant digits but we were just as i said at 434 30, 435 a couple of days ago so uh, we've given up um, some gains in yield substantially as investors pile in to those bonds maybe looking for some of the return that they haven't uh, had over the last 10 years and then uh, nymex crude up 28 cents but still under 80 dollars a barrel it's been really interesting to watch uh, the softness in this market even as we have a drawdown in supplies. Let's bring in Max Kettner right now, chief multi-asset strategist over at HSBC. He joins us live out of Copenhagen. Max, uh, let me first get your take on the big news of the day, which is yesterday's NVIDIA earnings report. I thought expectations were so high it would be tough to beat, and yet they did it. Yeah, uh, good morning. I think, look, um, just like we've heard before, right, there's really nothing bad about that report. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be pretty interesting how the stock uh, opens. I guess we're going to go towards a new all term high. Um, I guess in terms of the market sentiment, it's a complete switch from what we've seen 
uh, last week. However, I would also say in terms of the broader market sentiment, not just NVIDIA, not just AI, but if we look at the broader market sentiment, that's clearly become a little bit more bearish over the last, you know, the last two weeks or so. When we look, for example, at survey-based sentiment, look at the AAII survey, look at several other indicators. In general, they've become a little bit more bearish, and that is good news, right? That means that you know, if you get a bit further, further dips in is, in U.S. equities, that definitely is really territory to to buy on dips. Max, you've been pretty constructive in talking about buying on dips now for a bit of time. Is it more than just sentiment? Talk us through your theory or, or sort of your justification for getting a little bit more bullish as we approach the end of the year, because it seems to stand out as many people have sort of gotten a little scared off by what we've experienced over the last month. Yeah, I do think, look, I do think there could be a few further dips now in the next week or two, right? Or with Jackson Hole, or you guys just mentioned uh, Treasury Supply, right? If, if one or two of these auctions tail a little bit, yeah, fine. That may be bringing a few further dips, but those dips have to be bought, right? It is number one, the sentiment side of things that uh, we've just talked about, but it's also the fundamental side, right? Like you, you before mentioned the broad-based earnings recovery. Let's remember that we just had the second quarter in a row where average earnings surprise factors have picked up again, where the earnings beat rate has picked up again, both way above 10-year uh, averages and pre-COVID averages. So that's pretty good, right? And it's also really, when we look at the, the strength of the U.S. economy overall, that is pretty broad-based as well, right? Whether it's the consumer, whether it's you know easier financial conditions compared to a year ago. And indeed, if we look at some of the leading indicators of the manufacturing industry, right? Some of those leading indicators, let's say like regional Fed surveys, even the ones that we've got for August already, they're pointing towards perhaps some turning points, some early sort of turning points even in the struggling manufacturing industry in the next couple of months. Max, uh, fundamentals don't matter anymore. Come on, you know that. I mean, let's shift back to sentiment. Let's shift back to positioning. Let's focus on seasonals, the notoriously weak September-October period. I mean, should we be even remotely thinking about buying the dip into that, or should we be looking to hedge up? Should we be looking to cover our, you know, cover our bets? I mean, look, one of the features of this weakness we've witnessed over the better part of the last few weeks has been a stronger dollar. And, you know, my concern is that, you know, what does that mean for U.S. equity earnings? So on the second question, on the stronger dollar, but let's remember that the dollar is still significantly weaker compared to a year ago. So the fact is that when we look at the year over year change of the dollar, that's typically quite well correlated with earnings revisions of the S&P. The S&P still has a surprisingly significant uh, degree of foreign revenue exposure. So that weaker dollar compared to a year ago actually is now coming through now in Q3 earnings and Q4 earnings. So that helps. That's number one. Number two on the seasonals, I absolutely hate. I detest seasonality, right? <laughs> but we look at seasonality, to be, to be perfectly honest, if you do any kinds of studies over the last sort of 10, 15, 20 years, if you adjust them for the big events, right? Things like, you know, 9-11, if you think about uh, 2008, right? Lehman Brothers. So those sorts of things that, frankly, did, didn't really have an awful lot of, to do with seasonality. Then even in the last 20 years, seasonality is gone, right? So the seasonality gains that people were able to harvest, they really stopped with the with the surge in computing power, which I guess brings us back to NVIDIA. But it, it really, really stopped really from the end of the 90s, beginning of 2000. Since then, seasonality hasn't really worked, right? And, and also this year, let's remember, right? You would have thought, oh, let's sell in May. And what happened was that the rally took off in June and July. So even this year, seasonality didn't really work. Max, great talking to you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Max Kettner of HSBC out of Copenhagen, but still representing Bavaria with his uh, check <laughs> shirt there. <laughs> Coming up, we're going to talk with Libby Cantrell of PIMCO following last night's GOP debate. Uh, we're going to get her take on how much it mattered without the former president uh, uh, there, as well as what it means that Yevgeny Prigozhin reportedly died in a plane crash out of Moscow yesterday. This is Bloomberg. I just felt it would be uh, 
more appropriate not to do the debate. I don't think it's uh, right to do it. Uh, if you're leading by 50, 60, I have one problem leading by 70 points, and I'm saying, why am I doing it? And I'm going to have eight people, 10 people, whoever made the debate. I don't know how many it is, but I'm going to have all these people screaming at me, shouting questions at me, all of which I love answering, I love doing, but it doesn't make sense to do them. So uh, I've taken a pass. Former President Donald Trump there talking about why he skipped the Republican debate, the first debate um, that you could watch yesterday. It was on Fox News. Many of us had to wake up very early this morning, so uh, <laughs> we may have missed it. We've seen the highlights, yeah. um, and we know, we knew that they were going to basically all get together and attack Ramaswamy, right, on his um, outspoken foreign policy uh, uh, ideas. And economics, his position on economics, on on on, on the Fed, on, on on basically central bank activity. Yeah, I mean, all of which is is on, <laughs> is in the spotlight here. I think what was interesting for me is when asked um, whether or not uh, they would vote for Trump uh, if he were indeed the nominee. Yeah. Uh, not all of them raised their hands. I thought that was an interesting one. Well, you saw them capitulate also down the line. Yeah. If you watch the video, a few on the right side or left side, whatever it was, started <laughs> raising their hands, and then they finally started saying, oh, OK, I would, too. <laughs> you can yeah. kind of see it in the sentiment, like, oh, I can't possibly stand out that much from the crowd. Sure, I'll go ahead and vote. I mean, they're so defensive of Donald Trump. I know, Ramaswamy, it's you know, when he was indicted in Florida, went down there and, like, set up a stand to support Donald <laughs> right. Trump. Well, so that, and this is the sort of my takeaway from this. I, I didn't, I missed it. I don't know if I missed it. I, I didn't watch it. Did I really miss anything questionable, <laughs> right? But my takeaway from this is, are we really just watching a debate for who possibly could be Trump's VP yeah. nominee because it just he's so far ahead of the field. He obviously used this as yet another chance to stand out from the crowd. He's above this, right? And while telling everyone, oh, it's not fair. I can't possibly lower myself to chat with these plebes. He's above this whole situation and it just continues to, you know, they're just they seem to be the also rants. Unless it's former Vice President Mike Pence. He's not going <laughs> to be the next VP, and neither will Chris Christie. Let's yeah, get to exactly. Libby Cantrell right now. She is Managing Director of Public Policy over at PIMCO. Libby, I'm guessing you watched um, the debate last night, and what was your takeaway? Are they all, you know, vying to be vice president, with the exception of a few who have already, you know, counted themselves out? Yeah, I mean, good morning. I did watch all of it. Um, a little bit like watching Thunderdome at at parts. Um, I think there are a few kind of a few takeaways. One is the debate last night didn't really do anything to undermine President Trump's very secure position as front runner, as you've all been alluding to. Of course, leading in the polls both nationally, but then also importantly in some of those early primary states. Um, but second of all, this really was, as you alluded to, really kind of the 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 position for the jockeying for the consolation prize, the kind of the runner up. And in that vein, what I do think it may have done for those who actually may have watched uh, is remind folks that there might be an alternative. Uh, that's cer certainly what I think Nikki Haley uh, was going for. I think for, of course, Mike Pence, and then also of course. Of course, uh, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, who had the most uh, or second most speaking time, just second to to Mike Pence. So in many ways, I think this is sort of an introduction for those voters who might be other Trump curious, if you will, those sort of sometime Trumpers or, or never Trumpers who are looking for an alternative. But again, I think the big takeaway here, politically at least, is that this doesn't really do anything to undermine you know, President Trump's really unequivocal position as the front runner. When you dig into the details, Libby, um, I know that most of the debate was really focused on foreign policy concerns, but what did you get away, take away from the candidates with respect to their domestic policies or their economic sort of slant with respect to these con this conversation last night? Yeah, so I would say in the first you know, 20 minutes or so, there was actually a lot of discussion about the federal debt and around sort of the deficit mm -hmm. dynamics. And so I was, you know, as an economic policy nerd, getting very excited, thinking that we were actually going to have a substantive conversation about the trajectory of government spending. We didn't really see any details, though, maybe not surprisingly. Uh, so there were sort of these, um, you know, kind of superficial comments about how we're spending too much. There were some uh, folks who did talk about reducing the size of the federal government. That's actually quite difficult to do without, without Congress. But in terms of really, as you all know, the bulk of the source of spending over the next 10, 20, 30 years 
is on entitlements. It's going to be Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid to a lesser extent. And there was no discussion <laughs> about entitlements. So, uh, you know, I think with that it's sort of disingenuous to have a discussion around sort of the fiscal deficit or the fiscal or, or, the, or the debt situation without actually tackling that. And there was really, again, you know, no mention of that. And the reason why is it because, of course, it doesn't pull very well with folks, particularly some of the demographic of the Republican Party in terms of, you know, older, older voters. So maybe not surprising, but again, so I, I think kind of the bottom the bottom line here from from kind of the economics discussion is there really wasn't very much uh, except for again some sort of passing comments about reducing the federal workforce, which again is difficult to do uh, if you don't control both chambers of Congress. Libby, I wonder if we can't switch back to foreign policy. With the exception of Ramaswamy, all of the candidates actually at last night's debate said they were in favor of. Uh, you know, continuing aid to Ukraine. You know, I'm wondering, did you expect to see such consensus on that particular issue? And certainly there were more folks who were vociferously in support mm -hmm. of the continued funding of Ukraine. Again, I would go back to sort of Nikki Haley's statements, Mike Pence's statements. Um, but yes, I mean, there, the kind of the unanimity uh, around Ukraine was, you know, mostly supportive. I think Governor DeSantis kind of equivocated a little bit, saying he would divert some of that funding down to the southern border. But you're right that uh, outside of Vivek Ramaswamy, there wasn't anybody who absolutely said unequivocally, you know, no more funding of Ukraine. Am I surprised by that? Honestly, not very. I mean, just politically here, to be against funding of Ukraine in some ways can be characterized as being supportive of Russia. Now, of course, there's a lot more nuance around that, but politically speaking, that could be the spin. So I think that's why, you know, some of the candidates were careful. Now, they all did say, most of them said, mm. that in addition to funding Ukraine, they would also continue or increase the funding at the southern border. And that's obviously an issue, particularly in Iowa, <laughs> that plays very well. So you did see some folks really target their comments towards those early state primaries. But again, broadly speaking, just given how it can be spun, on the heels of the Pergogan, uh, Pergogan, excuse me, um, death last yesterday, I think it's sort of untenable for folks to be, uh, you know, really kind of anti anti Ukraine. I mean, we still have uh, uh, over a year. A lot can happen between now and next November when uh, President Biden will be turning 82. On the on the Democratic side, who? Could primary President Biden, or you know, if he decides eventually not to run, who's going to run in his place? Yeah, so I think it's act has a really it's an important point. What you just opened up with is it it is we are still super early days. Now again, on the Republican side, President Trump still the clear front runner. He's also really importantly, and this is kind of very inside baseball, but it's actually quite important. He has changed a lot of the delegate allocation rules at the state level to benefit him. So as long as he's getting a plurality of the vote in a crowded field, uh, he is very well positioned to get many of those, or if not all of those delegates in respective states. So he's kind of playing the inside game, if you will, in addition to uh, his front runner status. On the Democratic side, um, what we're telling clients is President Biden is very likely going to be the nominee, save some really sort of exigent health issue or what have you. Um, but outside of that, uh, we are expecting him to be the nominee. Just, to, just something to keep in mind is that the first of all of the sort of state filing deadlines comes mid-October. That's kind of the de facto deadline on both the Republican and the Democratic side for a new person to get in and to be able to uh, list themselves on the ballot in all 50 mm. states in these respective primaries. So that should be kind of the deadline. And again, we don't we don't expect any big changes on the Democratic side. Libby Cantrell of PIMCO, thanks so much for joining us this morning. And, and remember, of course, today is the day that Donald Trump is expected to fly into Georgia and surrender uh, himself to uh, Fulton County authorities there. So we'll be watching that as well. Rudy Giuliani flying in yesterday in a private jet, even though he's broke. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Matt Miller with Gina Martin-Adams and Damian Sassauer in for Tom, John, and Lisa, who are in Jackson Hole preparing for that uh, big meeting tomorrow. Now, 
Let's take a look quickly at what's going on into the, in the markets after NVIDIA earnings yesterday. Um, beat even heightened expectations. Those shares are up in the pre-market and the S&P futures are rising as well as NASDAQ futures. Right now, S&P futures up more than half a percent after a strong day yesterday in, in the equity markets as well. It was kind of a buy everything rally. We had investors buying debt too. They're selling off the 10-year today to some extent. Right now, we're bang on 420 uh, at the 10 year yield for uh, for 1998 to look out five significant digits the euro at 10854 so um, euro dollar coming down just uh, about one tenth of one percent and nymex crude just up about four tenths of one percent up 33 cents at 79.22 so uh, i guess the focus this morning is going to be on uh, the equity markets after that big beat yesterday, and we're going to kick off under surveillance this morning with that story. NVIDIA soaring in pre-market trading following another blowout forecast fueled by demand for its AI chips. Uh, the company's CEO dispelling fears that production won't keep up with demand, saying, quote, we're focused on increasing our supply. We have to do that with great urgency. And we are. And Damien, this is one of the things that you mentioned uh, this morning. I think one of the most important points here is that they don't make their own chips. Yeah. So they still have to get TSMC to put them in the front of the line if they want to sell the most product. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, but I think, you know, taking a step back, this is really more about this shift from what was once price pressures and inflation risk to growth concerns. And so, you know, as you kind of transition in beta regimes like that, it's not a clean transition. It tends mm -hmm. to be messy. So when you look at NVIDIA and you look at, you know, growth and, okay, go get me my growth, go to generative AI, I mean, that's the way you're gonna get it. You know, just how willing are investors, you know, going to do that when rate differentials are at levels that we've not seen in decades and decades and real yields in the U.S. are incredibly positive. And I mean, Gina, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you just look at you know, U.S. yields, even on a nominal basis, relative to the equity risk premium and you know, the equity yields. I mean, it just seems yeah. to me that there's a pretty big divide there and one we've not seen in quite some time. Yeah. Well, first of all, on semis, let's just not forget that a year ago we were talking about excess supply. <laughs> now we're talking about not enough. So this has been a really vicious transition and that's getting getting reflected in stock prices. Is there a rapidly. differentiation, though, there between because the type of like, chips? Yeah, DRAM yeah. versus yeah. GPUs. Yeah. But think about yeah. the, what that means for the supply chain and how much pivoting all these different companies are having to do and production shifts that are having to happen. So so not to mention, we also have been talking about deglobalization and diversification of the supply chain, semis being at the forefront of that. Of course. So there's just so much going on in this space. Um, I, I think it's definitely worth watching, but it's also worth dissecting all the way down to the base level. Now, in terms of the yield, this is something that investors have talked about a lot. And we also noted in our chart park about a week ago that the equity risk premium was at levels we haven't seen in years. It's in the second quintile of long-term history. You know, what does that mean really long-term? Term, well, it's the same as the third quintile. Low single-digit returns on stocks should be expected. But bigger picture, we, as we mentioned earlier, we've moved into this very different bond market regime than we've been in for the last several decades. Yeah. From 2009 to 2019, we were in the fourth quintile of history on the equity risk premium. We were in the most idyllic situation possible. Bond yields were so very low, your expectation, your return expectation on equities was consistently double digits. Lo and behold, we got 11% average annualized returns. Everybody was very happy if you were an equity investor. The situation is a bit different today. You expect yep. mid-digit, mid-single-digit returns on equities given where bond yields are. And that creates a much more tenuous condition, a difficult equity investing environment. Environment. You yep. have to do your homework. You can't just throw money at the equity market and expect it to produce. And we're going to talk with Michael Darda a little bit later about negative equity risk yeah. premiums. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, we'll explain what it is. <laughs> Leaders at the BRICS Summit agreeing to expand their group to include six new nations, including Saudi Arabia, starting next year. The inclusion of the Saudis, as well as Iran, the UAE, and Brazil, means the group brings together several of the largest energy producers as it looks to boost global influence. And I think this is a fascinating um, turn of events here. I mean, Brazil is the start of it. They're the B in BRICS, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but the Saudis are not the S. Well, it's really interesting because Brazil, of all the countries, is the one who seems to be most 
concerned with how perception is in the West relative to this new uh, regime that's kind of been forming. But let's take a step back. What we're moving into is a multipolar world where countries are going to be forced to take a stand. They're going to have to take a side between China or the U.S. in terms of, you know, ease of doing business, who they want to kind of pair with. But what's most interesting, and you mentioned Brazil, and I'll even add India to that list, um, those countries that can kind of remain neutral and not have to pick a side given their, you know, state of affairs, should they actually command a premium from investors in the market? That's something we've been grappling with, something I'd like to hear more about from our guests in the next few minutes. Well, I'd like to know why we even still say BRICS, frankly, because as an <laughs> investor, sort of, for, from an investor perspective, Russia is no longer investable. It's no longer uh, an investable equity market in the world. Um, obviously, emerging markets have really shifted in the equity markets. The biggest flows into emerging markets are going into EMX China. So there's two no two letters of BRICS that are already really <laughs> under question. Why are we still using this old moniker, which was developed, you know, years and years ago when this was a viable sort of segment of the world? We're thinking about adding Indonesia and Saudi Arabia. What are we going to call this? Thing? Because it's not BRICS anymore. Well, Gina, how can we call emerging markets emerging markets anymore? Yeah, right? so it's so the true. same. It's the same so statement. True. You know, but I mean, look, I mean, it, it's grabby, you know, and bricks. It's easy. It rolls off the tongue pretty nicely. Uh, we can call it brickies. brickies. Dude, if you can Maybe think brickies of a new for, acronym. for Indonesia and Saudi Arabia. I mean, uh, no R. No R, though. Jim, Jim <laughs> O'Neill. How do you do that? Jim O'Neill is, you know, a part of his claim to fame is just coining that term. So yep. if you come up with a new one, you know, we could be talking Bikisa, about you in 20 Ibiza, years. Ibiza. Ibiza. <laughs> All right, that's your homework right now. <laughs> Republican presidential candidates targeting Joe Biden in the first debate of the 2024 election with leading contender Donald Trump notably absent. The other candidates honed in on Bidenomics. I still can't get used to that, that phrase. While also sparring over foreign policy, abortion rights, and border policy. Not a lot of talk, as Libby Cantrill, though, told us about the economic policy. And there's so many tax breaks that are going to expire. I can't wait for the SALT um, cap oh, yeah. to expire that be nice? in 2025. Yeah. If they allow it to sunset, there's a lot to talk about that they kind of missed. Yeah, it's fascinating because there's so much going on domestically. And I was just, I spent a lot of my summer overseas talking with investors and everyone wants to know what's happening in the United States. And yet here we have a big debate where the entirety is focused on foreign policy inside the United States. So I think it was an interesting dichotomy with kind of the reality of the investor world. The investment universe really wants to focus on the U.S. Where's growth going to come from? How are we going to fund the deficit? Where are we going to, where are we going to see interest rates go as a reflection of these extraordinary de debt deficits that we have? And yet we're not addressing it to any great degree. So uh, maybe it uh, really reflects a dichotomy from what's going on in Washington and what's going on in Wall Street. I don't know. Gina, for me, it just felt like a bunch of Scottish nobles squabbling for the scraps from Longshank's <laughs> table. We'll see what happens when Donald Trump really comes back. That's great. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the importance of not that, but some of the other events that we're watching closely today. Jackson Hole um, in the immediate you know, in in the very short term. And of course, what's going on in China, Damien, we were talking about yeah. that this morning, um, key to these markets. Neil Shearing joins us. He's group chief economist at Capital Economics. And Neil, let me kick it off first with Jackson Hole, because, it, you know, there's a great debate this week about you know, is NVIDIA more important, more important to macroeconomics than this um, Fed summit? Still, we're paying close attention to what's going on out west. What do you think? Well, I think a lot of it depends on what your time horizon is, right? Um, I think AI, in fact, we're, we're back to undertaking a massive piece of work at Capital Economics looking at the potential macroeconomic fallout from AI. And I think it's going to be huge, but I think it will be felt principally over the next decade rather than over the next uh quarter or so. So I think AI has the capability and the potential to transform the global economy in many positive ways. Um, but that's going to play out mainly in the 2030s rather than over the next year. Jackson Hole, if you're a bond investor, is the kind of main event this week. What's the message we're going to get from Powell on monetary policy, on inflation? Obviously, we had fireworks uh, last year when he tore up what was a pretty wonkish speech and, and gave that commitment to, to kind of get back on top of inflation, delivered a hawkish, very hawkish message instead. Are we going to get the same again this year? I suspect it will be fewer fireworks given that the Fed has got a bit more on the front foot. 
Neil, I want to pivot a bit and talk about your perspective on China, because one of these sort of underlying beliefs in the market right now is that China is going to export deflation to the United States. And we're contending with pretty rapid deceleration in inflation conditions. If we keep getting this sort of deflationary impulse from China, what does that mean for the U.S.? But you have an alternative view. Maybe talk us through your view on the Chinese landscape and what that means for inflation conditions globally. Well, I think the first thing to stress is that uh, it's not that uncommon for China to have negative inflation readings. Um, it has structurally very low rates of inflation because of its high savings, high investment growth model. And occasionally that means that the, the headline CPI, CPI rate turns negative. It did so in uh, 2021 last. And of course, that was the period where inflation in the US, but also in Europe was soaring. So uh, there's no kind of direct read across, I think, from China to, to what's happening in the US or for that matter in Europe. Um, more fundamentally, I think you have to ask the question, why would um, weakness in China translate to weaker price pressures and softer price pressures in the US? Now, there's, there's several mechanisms through which that could happen. One is through old fashioned demand. So China sucking fewer imports from the US uh, and therefore reducing uh, price pressures in the US economy. But it's not a big net importer. We know that actually is a big, big net exporter. Um, the second reason is because it may pull down commodity prices. Um, big, obviously, it's a big commodity consumer. Now, there's been a bit of softness in some commodity price, uh, some commodity markets over the past week or so. But in others, particularly natural gas prices have actually been rising because of supply concerns. So I think clearly China matters. It's the world's second largest economy. Um, but I think sometimes there's a bit too much kind of hyperbole. Some of the headlines are a bit breathless. And I, you know, it's principally US inflation will be determined by what's happening in the US and US macro conditions, what's happening in the US labor market, financial conditions and so on, rather than than what's happening in China. Yeah, I'd just like to stick with China just for a little bit. I mean, dollar yuan is down 2.1% on the month. I believe it's down something on the other 5.5% year to date. King dollar has been a thorn in the side of offshore investors since as far as we can imagine. You know, what's the PBOC thinking here? What's Beijing thinking here? I mean, obviously, dollar yuan has depreciated. We're testing 730. Just where do you think it's headed next? Well, I think if you're a policymaker in China, the, the, the currency matters for two reasons. One is at the level, on a levels basis, there's a is there's, there's a kind of political message in the level, and seven seven point three seems to be a level at which falls much below that. Um, it starts to have geopolitical ramifications in terms of China's weak currency and what that means on the on the global stage and, and the, the the political fallout from that. Really, from a macro and financial stability perspective, though, it's not so much the level of the exchange rate, but the speed of the fall that starts to create problems. Now, and we're, we're no, by no means there yet. I mean, 2% fall on the month does not give you major kind of signs of stress in, or, or um, it's, it's not a major source of stress in financial markets. It's not a big inflationary concern or so on and so forth. So I think if you're sat at the PBOC, you're principally concerned about trying to avoid big moves in the exchange rate rather than targeting a particular level of the exchange rate. Neil, thanks so much for joining us. Neil Shearing there of Capital Economics talking to us about uh, China and um, the inflation issues that we're facing seem seemingly uh, slowing down at a great pace here in the U.S., not as quickly in Europe, right? I mean, they have bigger problems with inflation and a lack of growth. Well, if you just look, I mean, some of the people who I speak to in China, what they were saying is at 729, you saw state-owned banks coming in to defend the yuan, and that obviously makes sense, right? I mean, but, but to your point on Europe, you know, if you just look at rate differentials alone, Euro U.S. should be at something like 105. What are we at 108 now? So I'm not saying that carries all that matters, but if you're an FX investor, it's definitely helped you out this year. All right, we're going to, uh, coming up, focus uh, in a more in-depth way on NVIDIA. Mandeep Singh joins us of Bloomberg Intelligence after that big beat, pushes up the shares in the pre-market, pushes up futures on the index as well. Uh, today, in tr or at least early trading, it's all about AI. This is Bloomberg. We really miss the extent to which this 
interest rate insensitivity uh, would persist and, and the extent to which household balance sheets and corporate balance sheets have thus far been immunized. Their spending patterns have been immunized from these higher uh, interest rates. Lisa Shallot there, CIO over at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, talking to us about her views on markets. Uh, today, it's all about NVIDIA. And really, to some extent, it has been for uh, a lot of this year. The company coming out with a bang-up uh, outlook yesterday, blowing away the streets estimates. I think they expect revenue of $16 billion, plus or minus, and the street was only looking for like 12 and a half. You can see the shares up. Uh, 8% in the pre-market. Mandeep Singh, senior tech analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us here in the Bloomberg Surveillance Studio this morning. And man, I thought it was going to be tough to beat expectations because they were already so high, right? The stock was already up more than 200% year to date, and yet they've done it. Yes, and this is unprecedented in a lot of ways, and it tells you not only you know how powerful generative AI is as a trend, but NVIDIA, clearly, they raised guidance last time around. They beat it by $2 billion. They raised guidance for 3Q. Guess what? Chances are they're going to beat it again by $2 billion. And the reason why I feel that way is because the confluence of factors when it comes to supply chains, which was a problem, you know, in terms of getting the manufacturing capacity, that has ease. And that is actually helping NVIDIA the most because there is no other demand right now for any other kind of chips. It's only about GPUs, and they're getting all that supply capacity. So clearly, you see that in the gross margin expansion. That actually expanded almost 500 basis points. It shows the pricing uh, that they have and also the manufacturing capacity that they are able to get. Where are they getting that manufacturing capacity? Because this is obviously really key to the investor concerns right now. How did they clear it up so quickly? Where are they getting it from? And where are they going to continue to get it from in the future? Well, so it's all TSMC. And, and okay. what TSMC was doing before was allocating that capacity equitably to smartphone chips, to high performance chips, to GPUs. Now, with smartphone demand being down, PC demand being down, all that capacity, the leading node capacity, is being allocated to the GPUs that NVIDIA is making, and there is just insatiable demand. Even with the pricing they have, the demand far uh, outpaces the supply, and that's why you're seeing this kind of margin expansion. Right. Well, let's, let's stick with demand here. I mean, NVIDIA's GPUs are, are being used to build large language models, do inferencing, all of that good stuff, but is it enough? Is demand enough to justify a $400 billion increase in market cap over the past three months alone. Andy. I mean, look at the data center revenue. This is a $50 billion run rate business now. Seven years back, they didn't have this business. So you can compute the caber. $50 billion, and that too at a much higher margin than their gaming chip margin. So clearly you're seeing the best top line growth and margin expansion story in tech right now. And uh, the proof is in the numbers. I mean, it's not as if it's going away. They Last night they said they have visibility to 2024. Although some people were disappointed that they didn't call out, you know, where that demand is coming from. But the company is saying they have visibility. Yeah. I wonder why uh, they buy back $20 $25 billion of their shares, um, especially at these levels. I mean, how do you value the stock? Clearly, it's not on trailing EPS, but even if you look forward to 2025 earnings expectations, they're still trading at, what, 40, 45 times that. Um, Aren't they a little bit rich? Which is lower than Amazon's. So <laughs> I guess if you compare it to you know some of the other tech companies, they're still trading at a somewhat of a lower PE. And again, you have to look at the multiples relative to growth. There is no other company in that magnificent seven that is growing top line at over 50 60%. So relative to growth, the multiples don't look that high. Now, the question is, what happens after four quarters? They have two more quarters of easy comps. After that, the comps get much tougher. I'm sure they're not going to be able to grow at over 50%. And we know with semis, there is that cyclical element that after a period of growth like this, there will be a digestion period. And it's guaranteed you are going to see digestion because most of their buyers are still the cloud companies, which are going to launch their own AI services. And uh, they could be competitors in the long term, although there are no signs of it right now. 
Mandeep, can you take a step back and sort of right-size the impact of AI on the broader market? We just got done talking to an economist who was telling us, you know, AI may not impact the economy for the next year. It's a 30-year time horizon kind of impact. But it seems to me like we're seeing some real-time growth here. This is a lot more than just hype, which is how it was characterized just six months ago. So give us a sense of the size and scope of this. Can we see some real-time economic impacts really follow through as a result of what you're seeing? I think there's a couple of noticeable changes in terms of how software is used, the interface, you know, the co-pilot aspect is pretty much uh, being rolled out to everything we use in, in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's browsing apps or, you know, using software. And I have to say, when you see these kind of pricing from, you know, chip companies, semi-companies, these are costs for the software guys or for businesses. So at the end of the day, yes, NVIDIA's margins are growing through the roof, but this is somebody's cost. Mm -hmm. And those companies will have to bear some margin headwind right now because uh, they have to buy these chips at the higher prices. So clearly, I, I think the tailwinds that you are seeing when it comes to the chip demand and the margin expansion, you're not going to see that for software companies or internet companies that are buying this. And they have to figure out how to monetize or pass it on to their consumers. Mm -hmm. Mandeep, I wonder if you could square NVIDIA growth with the national security concerns that are obviously facing chip manufacturers. I mean, I think Saudi Arabia is a large investor in NVIDIA. I know two of its larger clients are Chinese, Tencent, Baidu. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, so I think there could be a pull forward element here because of the export restrictions and everyone tr is trying to get their hands on these chips right now. Well, guess what? If the U.S. government bans uh, all exports to China, NVIDIA has a 20 percent revenue exposure and they will take a hit. But Clearly, they have found a way to skirt around it through the lower performing chips. And right now, again, there is that demand aspect where everyone wants to just get hold of these mm -hmm. chips. Yeah. I'm just looking at uh, on the 50 to 60 percent growth in the Magnificent Seven, just looking at Tesla. Right. They have in the past few years, 2020 revenue, 31.5 billion, 2021, 53.8 billion, 2022, 81.5 billion. So they're growing it extremely. Look, look at their gross margin. They are a 20 percent gross margin versus NVIDIA, which is a 70 percent gross fair, margin. Fair, fair <laughs> no, 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 I, I, it's, a, it's a great point, although 20 percent of the automotive industry is still, still like a dream yeah. come true in terms of uh, growth for the rest of the market. Do you look at the secondary effects of AI or, or the companies that aren't pure plays? I mean, what else out there could be an NVIDIA if they focus harder, right? Intel is now entering the fray with uh, mm -hmm. GPUs that are capable of large language, powering large language models. AMD is already out there, too, but neither one of them has the supply in the uh, to, 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 to fulfill what the demand is like. Yeah, and I'm honestly worried about Intel because of the NVIDIA print, at the end of the day, you know, semiconductor market long term growth is still going to be, you know, high single digit to low teens. If NVIDIA is growing at 50 percent clip and, it, you know, it, it has a kager for the next three, four years, someone is losing share. And data center uh, right now, if you look at that market, Intel is the incumbent with their CPUs. They don't have the GPUs. They could catch up. But I think Intel and AMD being on that x86 system, whereas NVIDIA's ecosystem is uh, all ARM-based, TSMC, that just goes to show that there is a risk they will continue to lose share. And I, I, I think there is a shared owning aspect to what NVIDIA is doing here. Just to be clear, because my mom is watching mm -hmm. this morning, right? Mom, that's compound annual growth rate. <laughs> that's what Kager is. We've got we to gotta explain this jargon. Mandeep, great having you in the studio. Thanks so much for joining us. Mandeep Singh, uh, their Bloomberg Intelligence uh, tech analyst who covers companies like NVIDIA, and that is expected to drive uh, markets today. H how key has NVIDIA been to the rally that we've seen in the broader oh S&P this year? Oh, my gosh. It's been a huge part of it. I mean, obviously, in the spring months, the peak sort of concerns around concentration risk occurred, and a lot of that was in reflection of NVIDIA's initial announcement that they were going to just crush earnings expectations, which refloated, uh, you know, optimism in that space. But we have seen a bit of broadening over the summer, but this is still the bigger trend for 2023 is the Magnificent Seven driving everything. NVIDIA at the forefront of that. Yeah, can't be, I think, overstated. And we'll see it uh, play out in this morning's trade. Coming up next, Kara Murphy of Kestra Investment Management joins us. This is Bloomberg.
Now, unfortunately, we've seen this deterioration in breadth and it's sort of across the board. The consumer, it can spend if it wants, it has a lot of savings, but it's a question of confidence. They're continuing to prioritizing services, they're continuing to prioritizing food and drinking places. The consumer will start to face headwinds in our humble opinion. It's gonna be difficult to get to that last mile of inflation decline from 3% to 2%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Alongside Damian Sassauer and Gina Martin-Adams, I'm Matt Miller. Tom, John, and Lisa are all in Jackson Hole ahead of our special coverage tomorrow. I'm told um, that they are uh, doing some reporting today. Obviously, there are a lot of very important people there hanging out at the wherever, the Million Dollar Cowboy Bar or the Mangy Moose or whatever uh, the cool place is to go. And then tomorrow, uh, starting at 8 a.m., we'll have our special coverage of Jackson Hole. So 8 a.m., I believe until noon, New York time. It's 1 p.m. in London, 8 p.m. in Hong Kong. Definitely uh, don't miss television. I can't wait to see if any of them is wearing a cowboy hat. <laughs> Uh, Mike McKee had. Did you see him yesterday? Yeah. I did. I was on radio with Mike. Uh, saw him. Amazing outfit. Yeah. Yeah. Always. He always comes Fantastic. to. Fantastic. He, he always brings it to Jackson Hole. Not only did he have the cowboy hat, but the really dark glasses underneath. So he was incognito. Out I hope there. John Farrow has just like a piece of straw in his mouth. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> talking talking about the ranch. Uh, no, it's going to be incredible coverage, and I can't wait to uh, watch it. Today, the story is, as we've been talking about, really all about NVIDIA. Of course, there were other issues. Yesterday, we had uh, the death of Evgeny Prigozhin. Yesterday, we had the Republican uh, debate, but mm -hmm. not Donald Trump. Right. Yeah, and not Donald Trump meant not very many viewers and right. not much news. There was uh, an interview. Know, it was very I, interesting. We showed a clip of, I think, Tucker Carlson <laughs> interviewed the former president on Twitter. Right. Or it's now known as X, yep. right? Yep. So I wonder if people chose to watch that rather than the debate. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'd be curious to know what the what you know what the viewership were for both of the for both the debate and yeah. for the Tucker Carson interview. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Yeah, like yeah. Side by side comparison. Yeah. He was still front and center in the conversation though. You know, all the quotes this morning are what did Donald Trump think of the, the <laughs> debate last night? How what did Donald Trump what was Donald Trump weighing in on? So as much as he wasn't there, he was obviously looming as the figure that they're all gunning to beat. And it, it became very clear in the news flow this morning. We also yesterday uh, heard the sad news of the loss of Laszlo Barini. Uh, that was a man who loomed large over markets for the past, you know, 25, 30 years. He came up with money flow analysis, which is something that we all did a lot of back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. He made incredibly prescient calls at the end of the internet bubble and um, right at the, the, the bottom of the S&P, March 9th, 2009, he forecast stocks would then rise. And of course, he was very, very right. Laszlo Barini was 79 years old. Let's bring in Kara Murphy right now, Chief Investment Officer over at Kestra Investment Management to talk about um, what the markets look like from here. Kara, we've had an incredible rally year to date. The S&P 500 is up, what, 15, 16 percent already, and a lot of that being driven by what's being called the Magnificent Seven and really um, hopes for AI on the back of the success of NVIDIA. How do you see it? Well, first of all, I want to apologize for not bringing my cowboy hat today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here in Austin, Texas, so I, I do have one. But next time. Yes. Uh, so in terms of the market, I mean, you're right in that we've had this incredible run so far this year, and it's been driven by just a handful of stocks. Now, we've been looking for a broadening out of this market, last night's NVIDIA results notwithstanding. But we do think that eventually we'll start to see leadership shift elsewhere. You know, think things like mid caps, small caps, industrials is another area that we're looking at, non-US stocks. So there still are a lot of very interesting opportunities in the market. And it doesn't have to be just, you know, a party for the big seven. Kara, dig in a little bit, if you would, on that small cap call. This is something we've been watching all year as well, but that group has just been stuck in this range. It seems to be really struggling to produce a breakout, which is very unique in the long-term perspective. Usually after a major low in stocks, small caps do outperform large caps, but something's holding small caps back. What is that thing, and what do you think is going to catalyze a breakout in this group? 
Well, I think, again, we have some really great secular stories among those big seven. But when you look at the small cap stocks, we have this close to historic differential in valuations between large cap and small cap. So number one, you're being paid to take a little bit more risk in that space. And we'll also, if you look at the Russell 2000, we're down more than 20% from the peak last year. So you're right, they are very much still very in, in the doldrums, but you know that old maximum of buy low, sell high, you have a really nice opportunity there once the market does start to shift. And can you talk a little bit about the broadening trade as well that you alluded to? If it's not the Magnificent Seven, particularly after NVIDIA's announcement last night, then where are we going to see some leadership develop in the S&P? So one area that we've been looking at, as I mentioned, is industrials. Uh, that is an area of the economy that had suffered you know, pretty early on as we saw industrial PMIs come down, industrial production come down. Um, so we look like we're having some sort of bottoming in industrial production. If you look at valuations in the names in that sector, they're below their 10-year averages as opposed to a lot of other sectors where we have some pretty lofty valuations. So again, you're being paid to sort of take that risk. And if that's the next area of the economy to sort of see a lift, we think that there are some opportunities there. But I also want to mention outside the U.S., if you look at non-U.S. stocks versus U.S., similar to small caps, you have some of the largest valuation differentials that you've seen in quite some time. You have much more attractive dividend yields. You have uh, more realistic earnings expectations. So we think that there are some great opportunities out there as well. Kara, credit card delinquencies are above pre-COVID levels. Bankruptcies are rising. Housing activity is in decline. Yet primary activity in U.S. credit remains pretty healthy, right? I'm curious, what are your thoughts on U.S. credit, IG, high yield in the current environment? And do you think the Fed can actually achieve the ever elusive soft landing? So I, I think this dichotomy that you mentioned between, let's say, rising credit card delinquencies and still pretty active um, activity in the credit side is really because of the impact of monetary tightening. And this has been a very interesting cycle in that even though the Fed has raised rates an extraordinary amount, there are parts of the economy that still remain very, very insulated from it. So, I mean, if you look at outstanding mortgage, the average rate is about three and a half percent. So a lot of people, a lot of companies are not feeling the pain of these higher interest rates. So with that, as we look and particularly in high yield, a lot of those companies are um, termed out, so they're not going to see a, hell, a, a heck of a lot of um, increase in uh, debt until 2025. Um, but we do think that we're going to start to see an increase in uh, business bankruptcies. And so that's where, you know, as we look out on the credit curve, we would sort of stay more in investment grade credit, where we think those companies are a little bit more inoculated from higher interest rates. Well, Kara, I mean, doesn't that really take us to the resilience of the U.S. consumer? I mean, everyone's talking about U.S. success but it's really been the U.S. consumer, though this week we saw some pretty weak uh, results as from retailers. I'm thinking Foot Locker. I'm thinking Dix. You know, talk to us a little bit about that. Is this the signal bears have been looking for? So I think we're still early in that cycle. We don't think that it's flashing a red flag, but it's a it's a yellow flag that's worth watching. Um, and so typically consumer spending is a combination of confidence and also jobs. And so the labor market is still very, very tight. People are very comfortable in their jobs. We're still seeing decent wage increases. What we're seeing on the other side is confidence is maybe, you know, being challenged a little bit. We have somewhat higher gas prices. Um, and then we also have people who have wound down a lot of their COVID, like COVID era savings. Now we can debate about how much there might be left. But what we do know is that credit card balances started to go up earlier this year. And we also know that interest rates on that credit card debt has really gone up a lot. So it's taking a much bigger chunk out of people's paychecks. So it makes sense that consumers would be a little bit more cautious here. But again, these delinquency rates, if we look at you know a longer period of time than just compared to pre-COVID, they're still at pretty reasonable levels. One of the things that uh, Tom Keen points out a lot on this program is that we tend to aggregate this data, but it's important to look at you know, the, I think dichotomy is like the word of the day today, right? It's important to look at the fact that the lower three quintiles or four quintiles have definitely spent everything they saved up uh, and got during COVID. And only, you know, the, the, the top 20 percent are still able to do well. Can that drive the market? Is that enough for the retail sector? 
So typically that highest quintile of income has a disproportionate impact on overall you know, spending and GDP. That said, at the lower end, you have some interesting dynamics there as well, because during COVID, it was that cohort that actually saw by far the largest wage increases of any of them. So again, that, that means that they have a little bit more of a cushion, but the US economy can't grow forever with just that like top 20% of spenders. So I think it is a concerning sign. And again, it's another sign that these low lower income spenders are more interest rate sensitive than the high income spenders. What's the uh, what's the economy like down there in Austin right now? You know, from the boots on the ground perspective, cowboy boots on the ground perspective. Allen's boots. Um, you know, I would think it's red hot because uh, you hear about people moving from high high tax um, regions down to Texas and Florida. On the other hand, it is red hot and that <laughs> tends to crimp the economy, right? Well, I would say, I mean, the economy is still booming here. As you said, there are a lot of people still moving in. You're starting with a relatively small population compared to a place like New York. So you don't need all that many people to move in to have it grow on a percentage basis. So still a lot of buildings, still a lot of new businesses opening up. And yes, it's hot, but eventually it won't be. Kara Murphy, the Orchestra Investment Management. Thank you so much for joining us out of Austin, Texas. I was down there uh, a couple of months ago for the MotoGP race at Coda at the Circuit of the Americas. What a cool town. What to a cool town. In. It's like L.A. in the middle of Texas, right? South Congress. I mean, all those little places up. I mean, and then you've got Rainy Street. I mean, it's just an awesome city. I was, on, I was on Rainy Street all night, pretty much every night. Yeah. But um, Live music. Uh, yeah, very cool. Have you hung out in Austin? Oh, yeah. I love the river walk. I love to take a nice jog down the river walk. Not in this heat, but maybe in the winter months. <laughs> the and, heat and is a real is concern. A great school. You know, Claudia yeah. Som wrote a Bloomberg Opinion piece the other day about the fact that high heat has really had a negative effect on the economy. Um, if, you know, if you're a construction worker trying to get a house built, you're right. not going to have uh, people it. out there doing it during the day in this heat. Yeah, and all of that migration has gone down to the heated area of the United States, everything in the southeast and particular southwest as well and obviously we've had a massive weather event in the south southwest now with the hurricanes hitting southern california so where can you go you're well, going to have to stay in those high tax northern states if you want it to be cool and relatively stable well, just to add one last thing, although I know we're leaving, uh, basically uh, there's a drought in Panama and that's affecting a logjam in the Panama Canal. So if you want to talk about climate change and how that's kind of impacting things, look no further than wow. the South-South. Yeah. All right. If you are just joining the program, we have NVIDIA earnings uh, that came out of the bell yesterday, driving that stock higher in the pre-market. That drives the S&P higher in uh, the pre-market. You see futures here up six tenths of one percent. Coming up at 8 a.m., Bloomberg's Mike McKee in Jackson Hole speaking to former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. That's an interview you don't want to miss. And uh, coming up next, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern is going to join us on the first GOP debate, minus, of course, the front, front, front runner, former mm -hmm. President Donald Trump. We'll talk to her as well about uh, the reported death of Prigozhin taking a flight uh, out of Moscow that crashed. This is Bloomberg. All right, we uh, are still looking ahead to a number of uh, really important guests, as I just said there, and um, also to some data this yeah. morning, right? We're going to get uh, jobless claims out. Well, I think you have to look backwards. I look, look yesterday at the housing data. I mean, let's be clear, Matt. I mean, we saw some really, really weak numbers, but then we saw some interesting news on the new home sales front, right? I mean, they were better than expected. So, you know, if you're just looking at the state of the U.S. economy, I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? There's a, su there's a supply overhang base. There's not enough supply. And with rates at current levels, it's just going to be very, very difficult to get anybody moving out of their current mortgages and looking at new ones. But, you know, I mean, we'll see how things go. We have some more data coming out today. Yeah, and the housing market and the auto market have historically been these big leading indicators of economic growth, but they seem to be detached from what's happening in the rest of the economy. Is that sustainable? Is it not sustainable? It's definitely something to ponder as an investor because the equity market is clearly on fire despite this negative macro news. All right, coming up next, as I said, Bloomberg's Anne Marie Hordern joins us on the first GOP debate. This is Bloomberg. Joe Biden's Bidenomics has led to the loss of $10,000 of spending power for the average family. Unlock American energy, drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear. Put people back to work. 
by no longer paying them more to stay at home. Reform the U.S. Fed, stabilize the U.S. dollar. Joe Biden has uh, weakened America at home and abroad, and the American people have had enough. Senator Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, and former Vice President Mike Pence there. Just some of the voices from yesterday's GOP debate uh, on Fox News. A lot of people probably already had the channel on, so watch that. Others maybe switched over to Twitter, which is now known as X, to watch uh, the president, uh, the former president himself being interviewed by Tucker Carlson. Of course, Donald Trump was not at that debate. And Donald Trump is uh, today, I guess, he's expected to head into Georgia. Right. This is going to be the big news of the day is what happens in Georgia again. So Will the he debate get a mugshot? Be... Is he going to get know. fingerprints? Well, I, think I he... love Sea Island, Georgia. Yeah. I've never visited. It's one oh, of my sea favorite Island places. Is gorgeous. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. unbelievable. You know, speaking of climate, you know, we were just talking. I just had somebody write in. I mean, effectively, what's going on is you have a 200 ship log jam outside the Panama Canal due to a drought that's going on there. So your average. There's not kind enough of the... water in the Panama Canal. Exactly. Is the it's, issue. It was built yeah. in the 19, in like, I don't even know, the early 1900s. So the way it, where it works with the locks and everything, I don't want to get into it. But um, I mean, um, if you want to talk about, you know, something that might impact supply and be inflationary in nature, if it's certainly we're not talking about the Suez Canal whenever when, when that ship kind of completely blocked it for right. weeks. But, you know, these little things begin to build up. Yeah, absolutely. That that's fascinating and concerning. Right. Yeah. When there's not enough water in the Panama Canal. And we've had those kind of problems. I was living in Germany for the past six years. We've had those kind of problems for the last few years on the yeah. Rhine River as well. Also something that's probably very inflationary. Well, and speaking of Germany, the ECB has actually been way at the forefront of sort of trying to uh, monetize or figure out the monetary impact of climate change. And ultimately, the results have shown that the the impact will be through higher inflation volatility. Yeah. So to your point, all of these issues, as they pop up one after another, the net effect is higher inflation volatility over time, if not higher average inflation over time, which has pretty severe consequences for how you structure your portfolio, especially coming off of a period of time which was incredibly suppressed inflation volatility. Now we go to a higher inflation volatility landscape from a policy perspective as well as from a climate perspective. These are really strong sea changes that investors are going to have to contend with over not just the next year, mm. but over the next several decades. So climate change, I'm guessing that's not a topic that was really touched on too much at the Republican <laughs> debate yesterday. <laughs> uh, let's get to Anne-Marie Hordern, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, standing by after, I guess, uh, having watched the whole thing last night. Anne-Marie, I hope you got some sleep. Um, what was the main focus? Was it all about kind of piling on Vivek Ramaswamy for his um, Russia-Ukraine stance? Well, there's a lot of different topics discussed. And as the Wall Street Journal editorial board really puts it this morning, without Trump in the room, or as Drudge Report is calling the Donless debate, there was this room to talk about policy. Climate change actually was one of them, Matt. Nikki Haley had had a kind of a breakout moment there as well. There was a pile, a lot of pile on, uh, on Vivek Ramaswamy, the billionaire, the entrepreneur. What was interesting is many thought that pile on was going to be about the other individual in center stage, uh, Governor DeSantis. But but really the pile on came to Vivek and some of his views, especially on foreign policy. This is where we saw him and Nikki Haley really uh, go back and forth at it. And she said to him, you have no foreign policy experience. She paused and she goes, and it shows. So this was a moment where you had really hawkish Republicans take it to this idea of uh, a, a more populist candidate who's been rising in the polls. Um, when I was flipping through a lot of channels this morning that had a lot of individuals and voters uh, talking about what they thought of the debate last night, um, for the primary voters, Vivek Ramaswamy is someone that is resonating. But for a potential general election, when you need to draw independence, a lot of people are talking about Nikki Haley. And the Wall Street Journal editorial board this morning is saying she was a, quote, pleasant surprise. That's really interesting, Anne-Marie. What was it about Nikki Haley that really stood out? So I think that one moment she had with Vivek Ramaswamy talking about foreign policy, she really went through it. She said he wants to have uh, China eat Taiwan. She, he, he wants to allow Putin to just take over Ukraine. And then she also went into his remarks about aid to Israel. Uh, this was a moment where she was able to show in her, her former post as the ambassador of the United Nations some of her foreign policy chops. There was also a moment where no one really was able to match her. And 
and this was on abortion. She really wanted to level with the American people, saying that there can never be really an abortion ban. We should never say never, but she said it would be very difficult given the fact that you would need 60 senators in Congress. And she said that is something we do not have. So we need to have a consensus. And she talked about a consensus that potentially could be um, actually one that could be struck in Congress between Democrats and Republicans for this moment. Then you had Mike Pence come back with her and she said consensus is not leadership. But her views on abortion might be something that could do her well in a general election because we know that abortion is one uh, really voting um, is really a voting driver for a lot of independent voters, and we saw that in the midterm elections after we had that um, strike down of Roe v. Wade. Yeah, exactly, strike down of Roe v. Wade from the Supreme Court. So she took this tone that potentially uh, could bode well for her if she was to be the nominee in the general. Anne-Marie, I didn't see the entirety of last night's debate, but, you know, from what I can tell is Governor DeSantis stayed out of the line of fire. Who were the winners and who were the losers last night? I mean, was that the right approach by Governor DeSantis to sort of sit back and let, you know, everyone else duel it out? I mean, and for that matter, did Donald Trump come away last night? I mean, you know, what, what happens to him? Was he a winner and loser by default? So two things. I think Governor DeSantis uh, stuck to the sidelines, but the bar seemed so low from his camp. They really just wanted to make sure he got out of this alive and was still living on the next day in the polls. So if the bar is that low, he cleared it. He didn't get too much into the back and forths, but he came with his very well-prepared remarks and really defended what he said was his policies in Florida that should be um, the policies he wants to take nationally. Most no notably, he leaned, he leaned into COVID and took a swipe at Trump and how he handled um, Anthony Fauci. When it comes to the former president, I did also catch part of his interview on Twitter with Tucker Carlson. Um, not a ton of news was broken there, and he, he talked about the fact that he thinks everyone is just against him and he can get more ratings on, on this crazy platform. Uh, but the former president not there, he was also asked about. Very much the elephant not in the room. And this was the question that was asked about him. The candidates were asked by moderators to raise their hands if they would support Trump as the GOP nominee if he was convicted on criminal charges. Mostly all of them raised their hands. Amazing. Six out of these eight candidates. And they really put it back to the weaponization of the Justice Department. They are doing this also because they don't want, want to ostracize those individuals that are supporting the former president because he is just dominating them by 40 percentage hmm. leads in these polls. And while potentially today we're talking about all these candidates that may be shined on the debate stage, by this evening, you are likely going to see the former president go down to Fulton County, Georgia, and turn himself in, and there'll be a mugshot, likely, that is yep. just going to blow up the Internet. <laughs> and then once again, he's going to be dominating the news cycle. Yeah, it does seem like the indictments have really uh, helped, although... It's an interesting question as to whether he'll be able to run at all, considering the 14th Amendment. And Marie, what about President Biden? A number of uh, viewers have been writing in to me this morning asking, OK, the Republican debate, fine. Is President Biden going to get primaried or who would actually run if he decides, you know, a after a, a year and a half still to go um, if that he won't run? Well, at this moment, President Biden is certainly running uh, to be the nominee. Right, and but he'll be 82 next November. Display. His campaign was on full display, and that was a question that was asked yesterday about um, age limits. If you're looking for potentials on the Democratic bench, I think you have to look to the governors. Uh, Governor Newsom, who's been trying to build up a national case, even sat down for a very long-raging interview on Fox News recently with Sean Hannity. And then, of course, someone like Governor Pritzker, who has the cash to really potentially get in at a last minute. But at this moment, everyone is talking about Biden, and it will be Biden. All right. Anne-Marie Hordern joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much uh, for that. No one better to talk to than AMH when it comes to Washington. Coming up next, Earl Davis of BMO Global Asset Management gives us his take on fixed income. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Matt Miller with Gina Martin-Adams and Damian Sassauer. Tom, John, and Lisa are 
well, I would say they're off today. Uh -huh. They're off air, but they're still working. They're in Jackson Hole. Working. Uh, you know, <laughs> so well, we're told. Yeah, working so we're the told. restaurants and bars and, you know, talking to other economists um, and market participants who are out there. And I think it's uh, a great thing that they're doing. And we'll see them tomorrow on their uh, special. Jackson Hole special coverage starts at 8 a.m. New York time on Bloomberg Radio. I want to get into some of the big stories we're watching this morning. Under surveillance is obviously nvidia soaring in the pre-market following another blowout forecast fueled by demand for the ai chips that nvidia makes the company um, the C company ceo dispelling fears that production will not keep up with demand jensen wong says quote we're focused on increasing our supply we have to do that with great urgency and we are and this is one of i think the most interesting things because a lot of people want to make ai chips like ai AMD and Intel, um, and uh, NVIDIA doesn't actually produce chips itself. TSMC supplies them with all of uh, the chips that they order, and I guess they're doing a good job filling those order books. Yeah, and certainly Mandeep Singh did a great job of sort of articulating this for us, but they seem to have been able to convince TSMC to basically work for <laughs> NVIDIA. <laughs> they have no problem getting TM the TSMC to feed them uh, what they need, which is a pretty big shift in the marketplace from where we've been just three, six months ago. This was a potentially huge issue, so that's a big win for NVIDIA. Video and a big win for the theme at large in terms of its potential impact. Well, I was most impressed just with the forward guidance, or rather Mandeep's um, pers perspective of the forward guidance. He's yeah. comfortable with it, you know? And that right. was the big question going into yesterday, you know, is forward guidance going to be strong? Is it going to be able to satisfy, you know, what the markets are looking for? And apparently the answer is a resounding... Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, he thinks they're even sandbagging a little I bit. I mean, right, so, exactly. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Also, Boeing has found a new defect in its 737 MAX jet, threatening to derail delivery targets for its top-selling model. The airplane manufacturer found, brace yourself, improperly drilled holes in a component that helps to maintain cabin pressure. Oh. That doesn't sound good at all. The FAA <laughs> said the issue is not a safety threat, but it would still worry me. Yeah. I mean, look, Matt, you know, Qantas just ordered a bunch of Airbus, you know, Qantas, the Australian of airline. Course. So, I mean, I think that speaks volumes about the but perception the of... the safest airline in the world. Uh, absolutely. And I think it speaks volumes on just, you know, how, I don't want to say how far Boeing sunk, but the quality of its of its product now is just, it, it, it leaves something to be desired, I think. Yeah. How many years now have we heard something seems to pop up for Boeing? Yeah. Just about every year, every other year, this is the latest in a series of issues that have popped up, which is a great shame considering how robust activity has been in the airline industry and air passenger traffic still very, very strong. I've been traveling all over the place this summer. Every jet I'm on is completely packed. Every airport you can barely get through. It's been incredible amount of traffic and a really robust rally and recovery after those pandemic lows in that space. So, you know, it's a shame for Boeing not to be able to participate to the degree that maybe they could have with yeah. a better reputation. Now, Gina, when you travel, do you look at the plane you're going to be on before? Do you check? No, you check? I don't. I probably should. No McDonnell Douglas you know, for I me. Don't I, 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 don't do, I don't do McDonnell Douglas. I don't know if <laughs> I can handle that mental. those anymore? <laughs> the mental anguish that would create for me is far too much. So I just sort of blindly get on, do what I need to do to get to the place I'm going to go, and, and you know, keep your fingers crossed. I, mean, I look when safe. I can't. If I have a choice, I'll fly a 747-800 any time of the day. Yep. You know, And then I like fly. the wide bodies, but they're so rare um, uh, that you usually have to accept that you're on a 737 or an A320, and they just, they're just too cramped for me. Too, too slim anymore. I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big guy. Yeah. A Republican presidential candidate's targeting Joe Biden in the first debate of the 2024 race with leading contender Donald Trump notably absent from the debate. Candidates debated the U.S. economy while also sparring over foreign policy as well as abortion rights and border policy. Henry Hordern telling us that they even brought up, Nikki Haley even brought up climate change. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we just saw a picture there, Chris Christie. He doesn't want anything to do with Donald Trump in politics ever again. I'm sure I would assume Mike Pence doesn't either, but the rest of them seem just to want second place. Yeah, I know. It's so fascinating, right? It's hard to watch and think 
uh, do we take this seriously as, uh, you know, the real candidates for the Republican ticket or not, considering that the front runner is not even on the stage and is doing another interview separately and then coming in and bashing the entire stage <laughs> of participants later? So it's very difficult to sort of get your head around the meaning behind this particular debate. That said, it appears that there were a couple of standouts. So yeah. let's see where they go. It's very early in the process yet. We've got a whole year left till we get to the actual general election. So I'm sure there will be plenty of twists and turns. But uh, nonetheless, I guess there were a few takeaways. Well, I was encouraged uh, that AMH said that Nikki Haley had performed rather well, you know? I mean, yep. I'm, 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 I, that's a good thing, I think. But um, what's interesting is no one's talking about Mike Pence this morning. No. Nope. So, you know, that is a very interesting outcome because, you know, one would have thought at least he'd use that as a form to really, you know, talk about himself, about his policies, and I guess, you know, it, or the message didn't, right. for that matter. These are, you know, DeSantis presumably right. was the front runner just a few weeks ago, months ago, didn't really stand out last mm -hmm. night. I mean, Anne Marie informed us that the bar was very design, low from yeah. his team. Maybe that was by design, but nonetheless, really didn't make a, st a strong impression. All right, let's go from uh, politics to fixed income. I don't really have a great pivot for that. But Earl Davis <laughs> joins us, head of fixed income and money markets at BMO Asset Management. Earl, great to get your time. I, my first question is one that, uh, you know, maybe won't make a lot of sense. But I feel like NVIDIA has had such a huge effect on a lot of different uh, asset classes. Do you see an NVIDIA effect in fixed income at all? Oh, we definitely do on the, on the credit side of things. If you look at the the... CDX, which is basically the derivative for credits, that rallies or, or gets stronger. So spreads narrow uh, when you see NVIDIA do well, just because it, it does impact the risk tone for all risk assets. So moving beyond NVIDIA, other big news obviously is Jackson Hole. What are we gonna what are we gonna see at Jackson Hole, Earl? What are you looking for and how do you anticipate the bond market reaction to be? Yeah, I actually think we're on the cusp of a seminal change in Fed approach to uh, targeting inflation and uh, and uh, the resi resiliency of the economy. I think now they're going to pivot from overnight rates to targeting 10-year to 30-year rates, and they'll do that through one of two things and, and maybe both. They'll either mention that they're comfortable with a 3% uh, target on inflation as opposed to two. That's a basically 100 basis points higher impact on nominal rates. Uh, or they might say, you know what, neutral rate actually we think is is higher than we originally believed because we're seeing such a resilient economy. Again, that could have, you know, a 50 basis point uh, target on the higher rate. So what I think they're going to do is, you know what, they're they're coming to the end of uh, hikes. That's without a doubt. I think 6% is a, a hard, hard cap. Um, but they're going to let the, the term rates do, do the rest of the... Um, more bring in more more uh, resistance to the economy, you know, make it more restrictive. Earl, uh, thanks for joining. Longtime reader, big fan of your work. Let's talk about rate differentials, something you've written about extensively, specifically rate differentials between the U.S. and Japan. We talk about foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries. We talk about Japanese buying of U.S. Treasuries, or should we say Japanese selling of U.S. Treasuries. What exactly is going on there? Why would, you know, an investor in Japan where yields are so far much lower than that in the U.S. be pulling out of U.S. Treasuries and investing it back at home in JGBs? Yeah, you know what? How it has an imp impact. Prior to my role now as an asset manager, I used to be an asset owner. I used to run a, a fixed income group with $100 billion in, in fixed income. And how we looked at interest rates was uh, through developed markets interchangeably, you know, diversification and, and the like, because the underlying fundamentals for all developed markets, as we're seeing now, is very similar. So in regards to rate differentials, I think there's more than just the pa Japan to look at. You know, Jap Japanese 10-year bonds are 0.65. We can see that going as high as 1%. That's 35 basis points higher. That has a substitution effect on treasuries. The other two markets to look at from rate differentials is the UK. UK has a serious inflation issue. They have growth issue. But right now, rates in the UK are 460, about 450 to make the, the math easy. We could see that easily go towards 8% to fight inflation that they have there. And the final country to keep an eye on is Germany. People really like um, using Germany and US interchangeably. Rates there are around 250, and that could go significantly higher because of the same underlying inflation impacts that are affecting the world globally. And wage. Wages are, are more important than CPI inflation right now. 
Earl, we had a poor 30-year auction last week that obviously uh, stoked the bid higher in yields and all that good stuff. I'm wondering, can you talk to us about the plumbing of U.S. financial markets? I'm talking the TGA, the RRP, you know, Fed runoff, et cetera. You know, where do you see pockets of risk building, if, if at all? It's a great question. I, I, I actually think the, the markets from a, a risk perspective, financial stability perspective, are, are very safe now. The plumbing, the backdrop, especially after March that the Fed has put into place, you're seeing it there. Where you're seeing um, risk is just a repricing of bonds because of what we're saying, you know, um, interest rates globally could go higher. That makes us go higher. Another thing that could impact the U.S. is interest payments. <laughs> They're significant. And the assumptions right now by the CBO for interest payments is 3%. T-bills are at 5%. So just think of how that could add to the deficit over time. So where the risk is, is that repricing to higher rates, as well as mortgage hedging um, by banks. You know, if rates go higher because of the negative convexity, the duration on banks' books go higher and they have to sell bonds. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's a financial stability question, but there will definitely be murmurs in the market. I want, I, you know, uh, Gary Schilling uh, a few months ago, or maybe uh, last year, did a survey looking at how the U.S. dealt with the highest average interest rate in terms of servicing our debt. I think it was the early 90s. We got to a little over 6 percent, you know, in terms of the average. We're not there yet, um, but when does it become a problem? When does, when does debt servicing become a real problem for the U.S. economy? You know what, uh, th there was an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago which says, you know what, the, the, the deficit could rise by, by $3 trillion in 10 years. You know, that, that could be significant. I think we're, the U.S. in regards to servicing its debt is fine right now. We're still the, the, the country of choice. We're still the reserve country of choice. And I think the change to other countries as a reserve or currencies as a reserve is 10, 20 years away. So I think uh, the U.S. Is, is in good state right now in regards to... Uh, to debt servicing. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a Minsky moment from not being able to service debts and they print their own currency, but there will be higher levels. And a, a key thing to remember, the last thing one-year T-bills were at this level in the U.S. was basically 2000. Ten-year bonds at that time were 6%. It wasn't the 90s as far as the 90s. Early 2000s, we were at 6% in 10-year in bonds. Not average, but 10-year bond yields. All right, Earl, thanks so much for joining us. Great to get your perspective out of Toronto. Earl Davis there of BMO Asset Management talking to us about uh, fixed income. In terms of what to expect from Jackson Hole or ever, <laughs> the Fed is not going to change its target rate. Yeah, I mean, was, no matter how compelling. much you hate 2%, yeah. no matter how silly you think it is that central banks around the world have adopted it, it's here to stay. Right. Well, and I think the Fed is very has been very careful to even say 2%-ish, sure, that sounds good, but they will even very explicitly state that 2% is not their, their specific target. So I don't think that they want to go to a target. But how many times has Jerome Powell said he's not going to stop until yeah, we get closer to 2 percent? Closer to 2 percent, though. You see what I mean? Yeah. There's the language around this, I think, is very meaningful because the Fed is specifically does not want to become the ECB with a, an inflation target per se. They do have a dual mandate. They're very careful about this. And anything near-ish 2% has historically been fine. Closer to 2% is the latest language of the day. I, that 3% comment was pretty compelling. Yeah. If they do move to oh some sort God. of 3% level, I think that <sighs> would really create massive rifts. Well, in that case, uh, thank God we have Tom, change. John, and Lisa out at Jackson Hole. Yeah, Pearl, for sure. As well as Mike McKee and Let's whoever else we've sent up. out there. Maybe because, they're picking this up at the bar. Because that would be genuine news. Uh, let's take a look at what's going on. If you're just joining the program, we're looking at rates rising again, uh, 10 year up at 421, and the S&P 500 uh, futures are up six tenths of 1%. Coming up at 8.30 a.m., Michael Darda, chief economist and macro strategist at Roth MKM Partners, is going to join us. I got to ask him about Laszlo Barini as well, because surely in Ma Michael Darda's career, he's had a look at money flow analysis and the importance uh, of that. Um, and I wonder what the conviction is behind people who are piling back in uh, to equities right now, like Max, who says uh, that he is buying this dip. Coming up, Jim Tobin of the National Association of Home Builders. This is Bloomberg.
don't think this is the moment to declare victory. I mean, yes, I know on the one hand you want to say, you know, core, you know, inflation is is declining and we've got economic growth, but we have 5.5% interest rates and we have close to 6% GDP. I mean, that is not a soft landing economy, that is a no landing economy, that is an accelerating economy. That was Anastasia Amoroso, chief investment strategist over at iCapital, talking about the economy. We got some fascinating news uh, on the U.S. economy yesterday in terms of housing when we saw new home sales rise. I mean, we expected a rise, but they were even higher than expected, I think 4.4 percent uh, month on month. Um, so a, a, a really strong picture for the new stuff because there's not enough of the used stuff. Jim Tobin, president and CEO of the National Association of Home Builders joins us now. Uh, Jim, you know, the, the home builders have been on fire in terms of the stocks this year. And as long as people with 3% mortgages aren't willing to get out of those and go to seven, which, you know, obviously they're not going to, um, new homes are the only game in town. But they have problems as well, don't they, in terms of costs, in terms of finding workers, in terms of uh, those high interest rates themselves. How does it look to you? Yeah, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's simply this: uh, new home sales continue to kind of defy gravity of all of those headwinds you talked about. We continue to fight uh, the labor shortage, the persistent labor shortage uh, in the in the construction market. We continue to fight, uh, obviously, uh, seven percent mortgage rates, uh, and we continue to fight just supply chain costs. We're still looking at a transformer shortage. We're still talking about uh, other supply chain issues that continue not only to drive up costs, but uh, when you take those three together, it it it's strange that uh, that housing new home sales continues to be this strong. But like you said, we're the only game in town. Do you think, Jim, that there is a level of mortgage rates that does slow down activity? I mean, uh, we've been talking about seven and a half, eight percent mortgages, depending upon the mortgage type, as likely over the course of the next few months. Is eight percent a magic level? Is there a level that you would watch for where you see a material slowdown in activity? Well, yeah, well, I would have thought 7% was it, but obviously, uh, well, and remember, we're looking at July numbers, right? And in July, mortgage rates are really at 6.7%. I think the August numbers, we we may not see as robust activity uh, and, and optimistic numbers when we get uh, when we get later and look at look back on August. I I, I think that 7, uh, north of 7 is, is psychological. 6, six is, a, is a round number. 7 is a pointy number. And <laughs> uh, so my my feeling is that we're still uh, we're not quite at the top of what rates look like. So I, I think, you know, seven and a half might be that that magic moment. Uh, but again, when new home sales are the, are the only game in town uh, and you're a credit worthy borrower and you want to get into that ownership uh, space, uh, maybe you find a way to do it. Plus, you know, there's a lot of people chirping in, in, in a lot of people's ears talking about, hey, you can uh, you, you can you can get, get in the market now. And, and eventually when rates subside, uh, you can refi. So. Um, if you're a credit worthy borrower, there's there's still a lot, of, a lot of opportunity out there in the new product market. But it does appear that activity has slowed enough relative to the supply advance to create some near term imbalances. You talk in your notes to us about the, the month's supply on the on the market of just above seven. Neutral apparently is about six. Talk us through what's happening with new supply. The builders do seem to be pretty optimistic and are continuing to put houses on the market. Yeah, it's just again we're the we're the only game in town, and in in those markets that where there's still high demand and, and, and inflow of population, uh, we're still seeing that that we can sustain this demand. But like you said, how? But for how long? And at what point is that 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 break point where people really truly sit on the sidelines? And, and that's why it's really important. I'm really curious what what Chair Powell has to say on Friday. Uh, are we finally at the end of their rate tightening phase? Uh, we have one more rate increase, maybe two. I don't know. Uh, but remember, shelter inflation is 90% of the core CPI right now. If Chair Powell, he could fix this if he wants. He could continue to raise interest rates and crush the housing market. We've already seen the the uh, what the, the the what we're going through right now is because of that. Or policymakers can decide to help the Fed out, get us to that soft landing by creating policies at all three levels of government that help us put more supply in place and drive down costs the old-fashioned way meet demand with more supply. Jim, U.S. new home sales rose to their you know highest level in over a year yesterday. But I mean, if you look at mortgage applications, they fell to their lowest in three decades. If you look at the mortgage purchase index, it's at its lowest since 1996. The basics index, which includes refis, at its lowest since 1995. 
application sales rates supply what data points are most of most important to you right now to give you a sense of the state of the US housing market I think it's it's permits uh, that that's the biggest forward looking piece that we can figure out what our members are looking at down the road of course the NHB Wells Fargo HMI is another one Ford sentiment six months out we saw that for the first time this year uh, that fell six points back to a neutral 50 uh, a couple of weeks ago after uh, after seven straight months of, of an increase in optimism by our, our members that was following the entire 12 months of, of falling in, in 2022 so uh, I'm wondering if you know our members are starting to get a little bit more skittish like I said we talked about those headwinds uh, interest rates are the biggest part of that right now uh, despite demand still being out there. And that's why it's critical, like I just mentioned, that, that policymakers help us out uh, because I, I'm as much as uh, I respect Chair Powell and what the Fed's trying to do and, and bring that soft landing, uh, he has his eye on housing. And my, my fear is that they're going to go a little bit too far in order to cool the housing market or at least, at least really get shelter inflation down to a more manageable level so they can meet that 2% target. Jim, I know base effects uh, play a role here, but new home sales were up pretty much across the country with the exception of the West, which, you know, we're down 8.1 percent of the affordability challenged West, as it were. Talk to us a little bit about the challenges that are going on there. You know, wh what will it take to write the ship out West? Well, I, I, re I really think when you, when you look at California and the West Coast states, they're, they're amongst the most uh, regulated, overly regulated states when it comes to home building in the U.S. And uh, when there's such a big part of that, I, I, my, my, my feeling there is that, you know, while California has a housing crisis uh, and, the, and the governor out there is trying to get localities to play ball a little bit more, uh, home prices in California are, are absolutely out of control. They're the highest in the nation. But then you start working your way east through through Phoenix and, and Nevada, and, and people still want to, despite all the, the, the headline risk of, uh, of, of the heat out there, uh, people still want to move to those states. Uh, because there's there's a little bit freer uh, economy. There's there's home prices are a little bit more manageable out there. Uh, again, despite the weather at the moment, uh, it's still a nice place to live. So I think it's just if the if governments get out of the way and let our members build, uh, we're going to find that uh, the West will catch up. Oh, the West is the best, man. If I could find a job out there, I'd be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> Jim, uh, what about you know buying points? Getting those rates down, what can um, the, the businesses in the National Association of Home Builders do to help prospective buyers get in at 6% or 5%? And are they doing that? Yeah, we are, we are seeing some members do right, rate buy downs. We're, we're seeing discounted prices on, on homes to help, you know, help on the cost side to match those increased in rates. And we're also seeing a, a, a trend in, in smaller homes. Uh, if they're one way to lower the cost of a home is just not to build as much square footage, uh, it, it, that's a trend we always see when markets constrict like this is that, you know, a smaller product uh, that people are willing to get into in order to meet those those uh, those cost constraints. Those those are three of the ways that, that, that builders are trying to fight this uh, this environment right now and, and make sure they can still move product and more importantly, get people into home ownership. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Jim Tobin there of the National Association of Home Builders talking to us about uh, the big spike in new home sales that we saw yesterday. Month over month, it was 4.4 percent. But if you look year over year, it was 31 and a half percent. And, I, you know, base effects are important. Yep. But, man, that's a huge jump. Yeah, still. And it's kind of baffling. I mean, as he mentioned, 7 percent, everybody thought 7 percent would be the rate at which activity started to slow. Now maybe it's 8 percent. No one knows where this rate is. We know that people still have jobs. They still have income growth. They still want to own a home and they're still looking, at least for now. Someone needs to answer for me who these animals are up in Westchester that can pay two to three million dollars for an yeah. wave all their contingencies, all cash. I mean, it's yeah. crazy out there. Twenty five percent. Yesterday, Toll said twenty five percent of their sales were cash sales. Yeah. And that's a luxury home builder. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess those are the people that actually have the cash to do that kind of transaction. Coming up, Bloomberg's Mike McKee joins us out of Jackson Hole. He's going to be speaking with former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. We'll get his take on the possibility of a soft landing. This is Bloomberg. Now, unfortunately, we've seen this deterioration 
in breadth and it's sort of across the board. The consumer, it can spend if it wants. It has a lot of savings, but it's a question of confidence. They're continuing to prioritizing services or continue prioritizing food and drinking places. The consumer will start to face headwinds in our humble opinion. It's going to be difficult to get to that last mile of inflation decline from 3% to 2%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City for our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Damian Sassauer and Gina Martin-Adams. I am Matt Miller. Tom, John, and Lisa are on assignment today in Jackson Hole ahead of our special coverage tomorrow. That's a show you don't want to miss. Tomorrow morning, starting at 8 a.m., uh, Lisa, John, and Tom will be broadcasting from the Economic Symposium, the Kansas City Federal Reserve's uh, Symposium there at Jackson Hole, and they'll be on Bloomberg Television through noon. So great coverage uh, that we expect. Man, there's there's a lot to talk about. And I didn't think we were going to even consider the fact that they would move uh, the inflation target. We don't really think that's yeah. a possibility, right? No, well, Earl Davis thinks it's a possibility. So it's a possibility, I guess. It doesn't seem possible to me. It seems the Fed wants to keep that as waffly as they could possibly can and just sort of ease the inflation rate I lower like with pretty, some flexibility. I feel like they, they, they say 2% so much that even if they use language that waffles around it, I think everybody expects 2%. Well, I think it was interesting that he said the real goal of the Fed is going to be to kind of target the long end of the yield curve, which you know they yeah. can't do. But nevertheless, it seems to be interesting that, you know, just to even suggest the fact that they can even have an impact or an influence over it, it's kind of interesting to me. Yeah. Let's uh, get out to Jackson Hole right now. Bloomberg's Mike McKee kicks off our coverage with former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard, now at Purdue. Mike, take it away. Well, good morning, everybody, and good morning to Jim Bullard. You know, it's a tradition here at Jackson Hole that we start our coverage with an interview with Jim Bullard. Every, uh, every year we come out at 6 a.m. in the morning, and uh, Jim joins us in the cold. Uh, Jim left the Fed, but we're not letting him get away. He's joining us now from Purdue University, where he is the dean of the Daniels School of Business. Welcome uh, back to our show, Jim, even if you're not here in person. Well, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I wore my uh, Jackson Hole coat uh, in solidarity with the cold weather that you have to endure uh, every year uh, when you're out in the mountains there. Well, I offered you coffee. I just want everybody to know that, but you, you didn't want to come get some. Uh, the first question, and I, I'm not the only person to wonder this, and I'm sure you know this, is uh, why you left the Fed when you did and why you took this job that you have now. Uh, well, this is a great challenge uh, for me and and uh, for the Mitch Daniels uh, School of Business. Uh, we're going to get uh, uh, much better. We're already good, but we're going to go to great. And uh, I thought it'd be a great opportunity. I have been in the Fed for uh, 15 years as president and longer before that. Uh, so my time was running out. Uh, so this is a great ch challenge uh, later in my career. So uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, you recently moved, so you still, I'm sure, have a lot of economics and monetary policy on your brain. Let me pick it a little bit and ask you what you think of the economy at the moment. If you were still uh, trying to decide whether you would vote one way or another, are we getting signals that give you a strong view one way or another? I think the biggest question right now is the reacceleration in the U.S. economy. Uh, Atlanta Fed's GDP now showing substantially above uh, trend growth for the U.S. economy in the third quarter. Uh, that's following uh, higher than expected growth in the first half of 2023 and, for that matter, in the second half of 2022. So I think that those that have been predicting imminent recession are, uh, have, are having a lot of trouble here. Uh, it doesn't seem to be happening, and it, this uh, reacceleration could put upward pressure on inflation, stem the disinflation that we're seeing, and uh, instead uh, delay plans for the Fed to uh, uh, change policy. 
How are we going to do it? Let me separate those questions out a little bit in terms of uh, inflation. Absent the growth level that we have at the moment, and of course that's just a, an, a very early read from the Atlanta Fed. Absent that, would you be thinking that inflation would reaccelerate uh, anyway, based on what you've seen in the economy? Uh, there's some talk about uh, base effects fading and going the other way during the second half of the year. So we'll see if that uh, occurs. Um, you know, I like to look at the 12-month uh, numbers because they rinse out some of the seasonal effects. And um, so you could get uh, at least a, a pause in the disinflation or even a, a little bit of reacceleration. I think that would uh, suggest a higher rate profile for the Fed than otherwise. So, um, so yeah, it could happen. Well, Chairman Powell and the other members of the committee have been very careful in what they've said about additional rate increases because they seem to feel they're, they're pretty tight right now and they want to make sure they don't tip the economy into recession. How great a danger do you think that is? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think the committee should take a little bit of a victory lap here. I mean, the uh, unemployment rate is three and a half percent, and we were very aggressive in 2022 and into 2023. Uh, but uh, the real side of the economy has been growing faster than potential. Uh, labor market is still very strong. That should support consumption, uh, which should continue to uh uh, proceed a pace here in the second half of 2023. So, I th and and in the meantime, CPI inflation, headline CPI inflation, was actually on a 12-month basis was nine percent at one point, now three percent, um, and the core measures are coming down as well. So, uh, it really looks like the the 2022 policy, including 75 basis point hikes, four meetings in a row is is uh has a good chance of success uh, you never know but uh but it seems like it has a good chance of success here so if there was ever a soft landing uh taking six percentage points off the headline inflation rate without an increase in unemployment would sound like a soft landing to me well, the argument some of your uh, former colleagues make about not raising rates further is that we have long and variable lags that are just beginning to hit the economy. That 2022 uh, rate increase path is only just beginning to hit the economy. And we have seen some of the uh, sentiment indicators suggest that. Uh, we have seen manufacturing drop off. Uh, do you think that we really need more rate uh, increases or uh, should we wait and see if these lags are finally starting to hit and uh, this speedy economy will slow down at last? Yeah, I, I don't think that the uh, long and variable lags are quite what they were when Milton Friedman first talked about them uh, decades ago. I think uh, a lot of the transmission is much faster than it was at that time. Uh, I would point to housing as one of the prime examples. Uh, the housing market basically came to a stop in the spring of 2022, and at that point, the committee hadn't actually done anything. Uh, the policy rate was still not very far from zero at that point, but the markets anticipate uh, what the Fed is going to do, and so you got a big impact uh, in the spring and summer and fall of 2022 on the housing market. So that's an example of how markets pull forward the policy of the Fed. And I think uh, that's more prevalent today than it would have been in the 60s or the 70s. So I think these long and variable lag estimates are a little out of date. Uh, you have to think about uh, transmission coming much faster than it would have uh, during that period of time. A couple of newspaper stories, and now all Wall Street is talking about is our star and whether the Fed is going to be uh, adjusting its estimates. Uh, two questions. One, uh, what do you think it is and does it tell you anything? And the second question is, is it really relevant to policy at this point? I, th I, I think it is relevant, uh, but we don't have very good estimates of, of this number. Um, I think Chair Powell has said we really don't know. I think that was one quote from him on, on the R-Star. So it is an interesting debate, but you probably can't make too much 
of it uh, because uh, uh, the estimates are so uncertain. Um, I do think it matters, though, because people want to have some idea of where they think they're going um, in the medium term. Well, that's my next question is, where do you think we're going in the medium term? You've got some people who think, uh, John Williams, uh, New York Fed president, that our star, uh, the neutral rate of interest, let's put it that way, is uh, going to be somewhere at, uh, where it was prior to the pandemic. Others think we've moved into a new regime, to quote the old St. Louis Fed president, Jim Bullard, and uh, we're going <laughs> to be back to, say, the 1990s versions of interest rates and growth rates uh, and inflation rates. Where do you think we come out of this pandemic? Yeah, I think uh, the, the probabilities are that we are in a new regime that'll be a higher interest rate regime. It'll be more like the 90s uh, than we're used to uh, in the last two decades. And uh, the reason I say that is that I, inflation is above target today. Core inflation is likely to be sticky and come down rather slowly. Uh, and the rule of thumb would be that the policy rate has to be above the inflation rate in order to continue to push inflation back toward our 2% target. So you would expect from those considerations that interest rates would be, you know, rather high uh, over this time frame going forward over the medium term, uh, more like the 90s, less like the 2009 uh, to 2019 period where you had inflation below target and uh, interest rates pinned down at low levels. So I think uh, I think we have probably switched here to a higher interest rate regime. Um, with a higher nominal interest rate. Now, I would say about the 90s, you and I have talked about this before, uh, the second half of the 90s was actually one of the best periods for U.S. macroeconomic performance. So, uh, you know, maybe it's a good sign for the economy. The economy can boom uh, even with a higher nominal interest rate environment. Well, we'll hope you're correct. Jim Bullard, the Dean of the Business School at Purdue University, the Daniels Business School, thank you for joining us and helping us kick off once again our Jackson Hole coverage. Matt? Michael McKee, thanks very much for that. And thanks also to former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard, who was at Purdue but still wearing his Jackson Hole windbreaker. So I thought that was quite fitting. He said that uh, he thinks rates um, or the transmission mechanism is faster. And I, uh, I wasn't I was a little bit surprised by that. If you're just joining the program, we see the S&P 500 futures at least rising just about one half of one percent. You know, the. The, 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 the puzzling thing to me is that I thought long and variable lags were even longer now because everybody has a fixed rate mortgage, mm -hmm. right? So uh, nobody's moving out of a 3% mortgage and doesn't matter to most of the country that mortgage rates are at 7%. But we are more debt dependent. So if you think about how the U.S. economy works, it is there is a greater degree of debt dependency, certainly, than there was in the 60s and 70s, especially in the private sector, especially in households. And I think that that's what it means, what he means by the, the long and variable lags are not nearly as significant interest rates should be impacting the U.S. economy. I can't believe we're talking about transmission when GDP is running at 4% this quarter right. and unemployment's at 3.5%, but that's just me. Well, that speaks to the level, right? What is the neutral rate supposed to be, I think, is the really key question. We're going to talk about that at 8.30 a.m. with Michael Darda of Roth MKM Partners. This is Bloomberg. It's only quite recently that the markets decided to believe the Fed and to believe the fact that there won't be an interest rate cut from the U.S. by the end of the year. And that, that we've seen that coming through in, in, into the, the, the U.S. dollar. But I suspect that there's further to go because I think the market's going to be looking at the European data, the U.K. data, such as those PMIs that we saw this week and think, why am I so long euro? Why am I so long sterling? Maybe I should rethink my dollar positions. 
That was Jane Foley, head of FX strategy over at Rabobank, talking to us about uh, the U.S. dollar strength that we've been seeing really uh, due to the higher rates. Of course, those came down quite a bit yesterday, but we still see the Bloomberg dollar index at just about uh, 1240, so at relatively high levels. Diana Amoa, CIO of Long Bias Strategies at Kirkuswald Asset Management, joins us now to talk about uh, everything that's going on in these markets. So, Diana, really appreciate you coming into the Bloomberg Surveillance Studios um, this morning. What's your view uh, of what we see going on here with, um, you know, a couple days ago we were at 434 on the 10-year, and uh, it didn't, didn't seem to dissuade everybody um, from still keeping these equity markets at relatively high levels. So I think what's been supporting equities, despite the higher rates that we're seeing, is actually the earnings. Um, I think this last earnings season especially surprised. We've seen significant revisions in some of the key sectors that are big components of the indice, indices, such as in the tech sector, that is actually giving investors a degree of comfort that companies can still generate profits even with higher funding costs. And you are seeing across the world some central banks start to pivot toward a more dovish policy already. Can you talk about the implications of that and how you see that playing out over the next 6 to 12 months? Indeed. So what we're seeing right now is some of the specific disinflationary disinf trends that we've been seeing into last year have turned into strong disinflation. And I think markets underappreciate just how synchronized the disinflation we're seeing globally is. Similarly to when we started seeing inflation pick up, and the developed markets were ignoring the signs, thinking it was EM-specific or transitory, I think the extent to which we get global disinflation might catch markets by surprise. So that's the one thing that has been um, a big turn, and especially in the context of growth outside the U.S. is actually looking quite lackluster. We've seen the PMIs out of Europe. We've seen the data out of China. We've seen data out of specific emerging market economies, whether you're looking at things like retail sales in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, credit growth across a number of key economies. Um, all of these are pointing to tighter financial conditions starting to hit growth. Uh -huh. And inflation is actually off the highs, and we're seeing this inflation, which means central bankers can start to cut rates. And indeed, over the last few months, we've seen Brazil cutting rates, Chile cutting rates. Uh, we expect we might see Poland next as one of the major emerging markets to start easing rates as well. So are we moving into a world then, as you correctly identified, where emerging markets led developed markets on the inflation front? Are emerging markets likely to lead developed markets on the central banking front through the disinflationary phase? And then how do you structure a portfolio in an environment where emerging markets are potentially leading developed markets? That seems a very different sort of investment construct than that which we've lived in for much of the last 20 years. It is indeed. And I keep saying this over and over. For the first time, you know, the inflation dynamics in EU that we've experienced over the last few dec decades are actually coming in as an advantage to policymakers in EM who are early to hike, mm -hmm. and they hiked aggressively. So they got to their terminal rates much faster and have been on hold for long enough, so keeping monetary conditions tight enough that inflation is responding, consumption is actually slowing down across a number of economies. In that context, Portfolio construction would argue that if there is a chance that we might have recession in some of the key economies, you need to have some duration in your portfolio. And I know, given the context of the price action we saw in August, mm -hmm. duration seems to be going in and out of fashion. But ultimately, we think real rates are high in a number of key EM economies, and policymakers will be responding by cutting rates irrespective of what's playing out in the rest of the world. And that gives us comfort in seeing EM as a good diversifier of portfolios at this point in the cycle. Diana, back in June, you participated in the buy side panel of our emerging markets uh, investment conference here uh, at 731 Lex at Bloomberg headquarters. And, you know, one of the things we debated was this shift into a multipolar world where, you know, countries have to take a position. Are they on the side of the U.S.? Are they on the side of China? Now we see China trying to expand its kind of BRICS plus model. We see the U.S. making forays to South Korea and Japan. Talk to us a little bit about those countries that don't have to pick a side. Do you believe those countries should command a premium on the part of investors? So it's interesting that you bring that up in the context of we have the BRICS summit taking place right now. We had China announcing um, overnight that they're going to set up a 10 billion fund to support development in certain parts of emerging markets um, and to help with the supply chain integrity. I think that's a theme that's here to stay. It's a longer term theme. We're seeing countries across the board really thinking about where the supply chains are, where the key mineral resources are, and how to secure those. 
And so as a result of that, you've seen nearshoring, friendshoring become much more of a conversation going forward. You've seen countries moving more to ally themselves with non-traditional allies. And you've seen other players, such as the likes of India, Mexico, become quite strategically important to the likes of China, um, as far as um, India goes, to Mexico, to the US, as far as you know, their manufacturing hubs and, and how they're setting up their supply chains. So the nearshoring is, and, and this multipolarity is happening in place. I think investors will actually think about diversifying their portfolios from being too exposed to either China or the US in the context of if you do have a geopolitical fragmentation. And so you start to look at the more neutral countries, India being one um, that has benefited from this geopolitical uh, splintering and actually looks set to continue to grow quite rapidly, particularly in manufacturing over the next five years. So those countries should command a premium um, as this trend continues to go forward. You mentioned China. And, you know, that's so critical. From the, part, uh, pr from the perspective of a foreign investor, you know, we've seen roughly $11 billion exit the Chinese equity market in the last two and a half weeks alone. In the second quarter, we saw foreign direct investment in China, you know, down to its lowest levels, pretty much on record. As a offshore foreign investor, as a U.S. dollar-based investor, how do you approach China in the current environment? One needs to understand the policy direction of China. Um, I think what makes it difficult to do direct investment in China is just the uncertainty as far as regulations go, the geopolitical uncertainty, and the, the tensions domestically. So this is an economy that looks like it's um, decelerating and continuing to decelerate. Uh, you have sporadic bouts of unrest um, coming through. And then you have flare-ups in key sectors of the economy, whether we are talking about the financial sector with the shadow banking um, issues we've seen this last couple of weeks, yeah. um, in the commercial real estate space, which is key for uh, business, and in even domestic real estate markets, which are key for the wealth effect for the consumer. So from an equity perspective, it becomes quite difficult to look at the traditional sectors. It's not to say there aren't interesting stories bubbling underneath the surface, whether you look at tech and the leaps that China is making there on technology, etc. But from an aggregate portfolio perspective, direct investments become hard. So the second layer, then, you have to think about who benefits outside China, which countries are likely to benefit. Mm -hmm. If we do end up getting the old-style stimulus of let's just build a bunch of roads, buildings, let's stimulate the property sector, commodity exporters will benefit. So think about EM commodity exporters. Mm -hmm. um, China has now said they're reopening group tourism um, to Europe and the US. Um, they'd already started that movement in Thailand, and we see that in the recovery in tourism in Thailand. So that's another proxy of thinking, you know, if we are going to get more travel, then those are places that could benefit. So there are ways to position for the China story without necessarily direct investment in China. Diana, thanks so much for coming in. Really great to get your perspective, um, especially there on uh, emerging markets. Diana Amoa of Kirkuswald Asset Management. You know, the, the dollar call, I think, your dollar call, I think, is so interesting right now. And didn't we think the dollar was going to lose a lot of strength at the beginning of the year? And we're still at 1240 on the Bloomberg dollar index. Well, it's rate differentials. It's rate differentials. It's growth differentials. I mean, as Diana rightly points out, you know, it's more, you know, U.S. growth staying resilient and the rest of the world not really cutting the chase. So, you know, I think that has something to say about it. But it is creating a lot of interesting divergences that are certainly investable themes. And EM changes so much. I mean, think about where we were five years ago on EM versus today. This investment outlook is really compelling and really different. All right. Coming up, we're going to speak with Michael Darda of Roth MKM Partners after the jobless claims that we're going to get out in just about four minutes. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Matt Miller in for uh, Tom Keen, John Farrow, Lisa Bromwitz. I've got Damian Sassauer with me, as well as Gina Martin-Adams. We're about to get initial jobless claims uh, coming across the wire. We're looking for, the survey says, 240,000 for the week through August 19th. Uh, we're going to get continuing claims as well. There, we're looking for uh, uh, 1,705,000 for the week through August uh, 12th. So we're starting to get some of the numbers coming across the wire. Of course, uh, 8.30 is 
when this data is due. Now we are getting it. Initial jobless claims a little bit less than anticipated, 230,000 compared to the survey of 240,000, and continuing claims at uh, uh, 1702. We were looking for 1705. So really bang in line um, there in terms of the continuing claims. Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, is, of course, in Jackson Hole getting ready for the symposium that kicks off tomorrow. Mike, what do you think about these numbers? Well, they're going to continue to surprise the Fed because the Fed has all along thought that we would see unemployment rise along with uh, the higher interest rates that they've put on uh, top of the economy. And it's just not happening. Companies are holding on to workers. We are not seeing the kind of changes in the labor market that the Fed was anticipating. Now the question is, can they figure out a way to do monetary policy with a different kind of employment target? Also, just this morning, durable goods orders out uh, down 5.2 percent after a 4.6 percent rise the month before. Ex-transportation, though, up five-tenths. So I think this is probably, without having uh, the breakdown in front of me yet, uh, this is probably Boeing aircraft, uh, fewer deliveries yeah. during the month. Capital goods uh, orders, non-defense ex-air up a tenth of a percent after a tenth of a percent rise the month before. So companies still spending money, not quite as much as they were perhaps earlier in the year, but we are seeing uh, companies still ordering. And so that is uh, some good news for the economic growth story. Mike, how will the Fed balance this environment where you've got still a resilient job market, but some weaknesses evident in the manufacturing sector, inflation clearly decelerating, at least in the short run, can they sort of now start to think inflation has eased enough, growth could stay stable, but inflation has eased enough, and then move to a stable sort of policy stance? Or is that not enough of a justification? Do they actually need to see weakness in the job market evolve? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, they say they need to see some weakness in the job market. And of course, next week we'll get uh, the August jobs figures and we'll see if it shows up at all. We have seen at least slower job creation. But as you point out, inflation has come down. The question is, will it keep going down? Uh, they don't know. And so they're probably uh, thinking it's too early to say that we are done. Uh, we spoke with Jim Bullard, the former St. Louis president, uh, just a few moments ago. And he basically said uh, he thinks we're still in line to get higher rates. I think the biggest question right now is the reacceleration in the U.S. economy. Uh, Atlanta Fed's GDP now showing substantially above uh, trend growth for the U.S. economy in the third quarter. Uh, that's following uh, higher than expected growth in the first half of 2023 and for that matter in the second half of 2022. So we are watching to see what comes out of this meeting and Jay Powell's speech tomorrow morning uh, to see if he is going to be able to balance uh, all of these things that Gina was talking about. Mike, you mentioned durable goods. Uh, you know me. All I care about is cars. I see durable goods orders were yeah. down 5.2 percent, but X transportation up 0.5 percent. What does that mean? Well, basically, it was, as I suggested, uh, aircraft. We see that uh, non-defense aircraft uh, were down 43.6 percent on the month. And this is what you get out of Boeing. Uh, they are they, the, the, Their planes cost so much that they have an outsize effect on durable goods. Last month, they were up 71 percent. This month, down 43 percent. Uh, you'll be happy to know, Matt, that the automakers are still working. The uh, vehicles and parts orders were up eight-tenths of a percent during the month. So, so it is X transportation, but it's really only X Boeing aircraft. Got it. All right. So it's not about cars. If it's not about the cars um, or the Grateful Dead, then I don't care that much. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Michael McKee there coming to us from Jackson Hole, where he is uh, reporting ahead of the Fed Symposium tomorrow. Of course, we're in for Tom, John and Lisa. They're out doing some reporting at Jackson Hole as well. And there could be some really big market moving speeches uh, out of this symposium or maybe not. Let's ask Michael Darda, chief economist and macro strategist at Roth MKM Partners. Michael, you know, what do you expect from the Fed um, in a week when a lot of people have been saying NVIDIA is maybe more important than Jay Powell's speech? Thanks for having me on, Matt. 
Well, that's clearly been the case in terms of the equity market, as we've seen. Uh, all eyes are going to be on Powell tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, you know, last year it was very short, very blunt, very to the point, but the Fed has certainly moved quite a bit, um, you know, over the course of the last year and a half. So I don't think Powell's intent here is going to be to make new news. I think, you know, essentially the Fed is getting close to where it thinks the, the policy rate is above neutral, uh, but their eyes are on the macro data. And you just heard Bullard there uh, essentially saying if the data looks like it's above trend, the Fed's going to believe that the job is not quite finished. So I really don't think Powell is going to come out and make some kind of declaration that the Fed is is done tightening. I, I think they're going to take it meeting by meeting, which is you know what they've been saying. Michael, rising real yields are a negative for risk assets. Here we have the U.S. 10-year real yield approaching 10 percent. It's jumped something on the order of 50 bips since July. Just how much higher can real yields go from here? Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, they could certainly go higher with tighter Fed policy. Real rates can go up. Uh, but you know, consider the fact that the last period in which we had 10-year real yields around 200 basis points spanning from 2003 to 2009, the forward P.E. ratio on the S&P 500 was right around 15. And we're back above 19 times now. We were at you know, 20 times forward estimates uh, earlier this year before a pullback started. So I think that ultimately is going to be a hurdle for the equity market. There is competition now. Uh, from the bond market, and there's a lot of competition from cash. You know, we published a piece yesterday that took a look at the Treasury bill yield relative to the earnings yield on stocks, and, and T bill yields are now higher than the earnings yield on the S and P 500. That's actually fairly rare historically, and when it ha has occurred, uh, the equity market has has tended to to fall into fairly serious corrections or bear markets. It's going to be impossible to time. Uh, but the point is a good one. The higher the yield, the lower the P.E. ratio. And we have pretty elevated P.E. ratios now in the equity market, even on a, on a forward looking basis. But this is great for, you know, Tom Keen is in a triple leveraged all cash <laughs> yeah. fund. Right. So he's been doing very well. This is when Gina Michael's going to talk about the equity risk premium or the negative yeah, yeah. equity risk premium, which, uh, you know, it's difficult for me to get my head around that. Right. Well, I so the thing I think you want to focus on with respect to the equity risk premium is most analysts are going to look at the P.E. on the S&P 500 and compare that to some version of a yield or a cash yield, as Michael does in some of his notes. And I think that the, the missing link there is when you look at the P.E. of the S&P 500, you're really looking at a distorted P.E. based upon seven stocks. When you look at the rest of the broader equity markets, you look at global stocks, you look at small cap stocks, you look at the X7 S&P 500, you actually find the risk premium is much closer to long term average. But you do have these distortions, which are creating this really bizarre environment for investment. I mean, my question to Mike would Michael would be. Where are we going to go with this, Michael? Are we going to see uh, some rotation then as a default of the equity risk premium, or is this just a sell all stocks because you're selling the top seven? Yeah, that's a really important point and a great question. I think, you know, the answer is it really depends on how the business cycle fares from here. So we have been seeing the rally broaden out, and we're hearing the word soft landing and even Goldilocks now. Um, you know, fairly, fairly frequently. And so it looks like a soft landing in the sense that the economy has slowed to about trend, inflation is coming down, and that's starting to catalyze a lot of confidence that we'll avoid a recession. And there's no recession happening now. We know there's a recession on if the unemployment rate is lifting, and that has not occurred yet. Uh, but I don't think we're quite out of the woods in terms of you know, looking out over the next year. I still think the probability of a recession is quite high just because we dodged one in the first half of the year. Q3 looks like it's shaping up pretty well so far. I think it's a bit premature to say, OK, the coast is, is clear now. So if we do end up with a recession hitting sometime between now and, say, the end of next summer, you know, I think that's going to be a difficult environment for the equity market, even you know, even given the fact that we've had these distortions by the, the seven stocks you mentioned, the rest of the market certainly doesn't look that expensive. But an environment where top line growth is weakening and potentially even falling and you have that that pressure on profit margins, I think we're going to have 
difficulty in risk assets and not just equity markets. I mean, the high yield market looks insanely expensive here. So I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. The triple levered <laughs> cash fund, Matt, that, uh, that Tom <laughs> is a pretty good way to go here. He's done, he's done very well, but he's avoided Bitcoin uh, from, I have to say, from like $600 when I first talked to him about it. He could have made a killing in it. Uh, I want to ask about getting back to Jackson Hole, um, how restrictive the Fed is, because you point out that we have obviously an inverted yield curve. We're seeing a shrinkage in money supply for the first time in who knows how long, and that typically um, indicates a recession is coming, both of those things. On the other hand, you know, Neil Dutta, um, after, the no, after the minute, it's put out a note um, pointing out something that Damien was bringing up earlier as well, which is that we have unemployment at three and a half percent. We have growth that looks like four percent right now. So how restrictive can the Fed really be? Yeah, I think that's the, the critical question for the Fed. If they're looking at, you know, the, the coincident data month by month, week by week, if the data looks like it's coming in above trend, the Fed is going to assume that whatever the policy rate is, it's not high enough, right? So that's why there's still a question about whether they raise rates again and, and whether they're really done and the futures markets have been, you know, starting to price in at least one more rate hike, although it's, you know, low probability. Uh, so if you continue to get hot data, then the Fed is just going to keep at it because they don't, you know, they will admit they don't really know where the so-called called R star, the equilibrium interest mm. rate. If you think about what they've, most of them have been saying, the FOMC voters since last year, they're right. talking about getting to a restrictive stance and holding there. And if you ask them to define what, you know, what does that mean? It means that activity is coming in below trend. So if that's yep. not happening, the Fed's gonna keep at it until it does happen. And you know, in my mind, that's actually the risk to the to the business cycle. And you know, that, that reinforces the message of the yield curve and money and some of these longer leading indicators that tend to weaken well before recessions hit. The problem is, you know, there are long and varied lags. Yep. And so it's impossible to time. And you can have these rip roaring equity market rallies, even if they're narrowly driven, yeah. uh, lead in an economic cycle. We saw that in 06, 07. We also yep. saw that in 89, 90. So, uh, that one was before most of our time here on the yeah. panel. You know, uh, it didn't happen. Uh, absolutely. For all of us here, definitely way before our times. Michael, thanks so much. Michael Darda there of Roth uh, MKM talking to us about rates. If you're just joining the program, the S&P 500 is rising this morning. The futures are up four tenths of one percent. In terms of uh, our star and restrictive rates, I think that's going to be the big debate, right? I mean, I guess it's always a debate. Do we ever know what our star is? No. I, well, I mean, look, I mean, taking a step back, we had that claims data came out. For me, it's just more of the same, right? We have had 31 positive payroll prints going back to December of 2020. We're going to get a 32nd. It's going to keep on going. Mm -hmm. And so for me, if you're just looking ahead of the next Fed meeting, there are only two data points that matter, payrolls next week and then CPI in mid-month. That's kind of what we're going to be focused on. Yeah, and I was trying to, that's what I was trying to get out of Mike, is can the Fed pause with the job market still fairly stable? Yeah. Can they just lean on that inflation, the disinflation trend more? I don't know. This is a key question because they continually point to the job market as unusually strong, and all the data suggests it's going to remain unusually strong. And it's in an election year. Yeah, well, that doesn't play any role no. in what the Fed <laughs> no. does. Coming up, Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on National Defense Strategy. Russia behaves as a thug state where laws that, uh, don't work, where everyone can be killed, I don't know, poisoned or blown up. And it's uh, plausible that Putin will continue cleansing from any alternative voice and Russia will become fully a totalitarian state with a cult of Putin. It's uh, not a mistake or accident for sure, it's a direct uh, blow of, of Prigozhin. Svetlana Chikanovskaya there, the Belarus opposition leader, speaking with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo earlier uh, this morning. Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy, joins us now to talk about what this means uh, for Russia, what this means for Ukraine and the world. Um, so great to have you on the program. We really appreciate you joining us uh, this morning at such short notice. Can I ask first, 
uh, what this means for the Wagner group. I mean, my initial thought was they're the only uh, soldiers that seem to be making a difference for Russia in its war on Ukraine. And now with the head cut off the snake, so to speak, uh, it seems that they would be fairly useless. I think that's right. Uh, what happened to Prigozhin was uh, obviously predictable. Uh, when it would happen wasn't. Uh, but it reminds me of the end of the movie Casablanca, where the police chief says, I'm shocked, round up the usual suspects. Uh -huh. uh, at any rate, he's gone. He was the motivator for them. And I think the trainer and leader of them, they were required, so I understand, so it was reported, uh, to sign uh, some oath of allegiance to Putin, which was why uh, Prigozhin uh, led that mini uh, whatever, in the first place, mini-mutiny in the first place, uh, because he realized that, that his body was being, <laughs> the body was being cut off from the head of the snake. Uh, and now uh, it surprises me that he would have flown in an airplane identified with him uh, out of the uh, Moscow airport. I mean, seems very careless. So I, I don't really get that. But I, don't, I think the mutiny uh, of that group is over. Will something else happen? Perhaps, because uh, Putin is weakened by this. That mini-mutiny got very close to Russia. He handled it in a bizarre fashion. He basically did nothing for about a month and tried to figure out what was next. He's also now um, been indicted for war crimes and could not go to the BRICS meeting, this meeting of Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, and South Africa in South Africa a few days ago had to send a video in. And what I learned from that is that he's caged. So I'm not sure he gets stronger. I, your commentator said he will get stronger. I'm not sure he personally will get stronger. That doesn't mean that democracy will rise up in Russia anytime soon. Jane, I wonder if you could just talk to us about the Siloviki, you know, Putin's inner circle, Gerasimov, Lavrov, you know, the rest of them. What does, what does Prigozhin's death mean for them? Is this just a part of doing the job in Russia? Uh, you know, yes. Is it business in, as usual? Yes. But he plays people off against other people. He was tolerating Prigozhin because he, I think he was pretty anxious that his inner uh, military circle, especially Shoigu, uh, weren't getting the job done. And they weren't getting the job done in Ukraine. Uh, I don't know who he's going to use to play off against whom, but I, I do think that that will continue to happen. And I do think all of them have to worry. If we could just uh, focus on Ukraine for a moment, uh, there's a lot of news coverage that, that the war is not going well for Ukraine. Well, how about this? Um, uh, Russia is still blockading Ukraine uh, grain going to Africa. Putin's video at the BRICS conference said, well, it's Ukraine's fault, not our fault. Yeah, right. Uh, that is the Black Sea is, is uh, open waters, and it's bordered by three NATO countries. Maybe it's time for NATO to institute a no-fly zone over the Black Sea and let that grain move uh, on Ukrainian vessels. Uh, I think that would send a strong message to Russia when Putin is weakened, and perhaps that would uh, hasten, uh, one, one would hope, uh, some retreat from this ridiculous, illegal, and cruel war he's waging. Bring this home for us, if you would, Jane, and talk about the implications that this may have on the dynamics of support inside of Washington. Uh, obviously, we just had the presidential debate, the yeah. Republican uh, debate last night. It was certainly mentioned, and foreign, foreign policy is a hot topic, but how might this impact uh, just, you know, what's happening among policymakers here at home? Well, there's no love lost in Congress for, for Putin. Perhaps uh, former President Trump still likes the guy, but his, his uh, fortunes seem to be flagging a bit, and perhaps Putin is trying to uh, outlast the 24, uh, 2024 election in the U.S., hoping that Trump will come back. Mm -hmm. uh, but Congress is of a mixed mind. You heard that about half the people on the stage, uh, especially Vice President Pence and Nikki Haley, were vocal in support for continued aid to Ukraine, uh, as I am and I think as most Democrats are. And the DOD is front-loading some of the additional costs uh, for weapons and support uh, into or trying to uh, front load it into the next budget plus a supplemental. So hopefully Congress will approve that. Remember, there is support, strong support by Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate. And uh, I haven't heard Kevin McCarthy's latest uh, 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 version of this. 
um, and we could we could be heading for a shutdown, unfortunately, uh, at the end of September. But I'm betting that Congress keeps funding the war, and I think Congress should keep funding the war. And I think that uh, uh, the future of, of uh, peace in the West is at stake if we don't stop Russia. Jane, Wagner is very well represented in the Sahel region. I'm talking Central African Republic, uh, Sudan, Libya, Syria. What does Prigozhin's death mean? Uh, what kind of void does this leave for these countries? Well, it, it leaves a void. I mean, he was the leader of a very profitable and probably very corrupt mercenary group in Africa. Uh, I don't sense or I haven't heard about uh, his deputy uh, moving in to fill the role. And again, I think Putin wields pretty long tentacles and somebody might be afraid of, of uh, crossing Putin, assuming it's another Russian. Uh, and these are mostly Russian mercenaries. Perhaps some other group will fill the void. But it does, it does say uh, to some in Africa who were dependent on this mercenary group uh, that they better uh, watch out that protection has maybe been removed. All right, Jane, great to get your thoughts this morning. And again, we really appreciate your insight. Uh, I don't think there's anyone we could have gone to uh, with a better idea of what's going on. Jane Harmon there, the Commission on the National Defense Strategy. Um, appreciate your time. Now, while we were speaking, we saw a red hot, sticky headline cross uh, the Bloomberg terminal that the Turkish lira has extended its rally against the U.S. dollar uh, to more than 6 percent. This after the Turkish central bank raised interest rates far more than expected. The currency was trading, uh, uh, is trading, I should say, at about 25 and a half for a dollar, which to me is an astronomically weak mm -hmm. level. You know, I yeah. mean, uh, last time I was in Turkey, I was buying like five or six lira for for a dollar. Um, but, Damien, talk to us about what's going on here and where we are now in their fight against inflation. Well, I mean, it's very clear. I mean, the, the lira, I mean, net F, basically they have negative uh, FX reserves there. So they really can't support the currency the way they used to. I'm talking about the central bank. But what's most interesting to me is that when people talk about declines in the lira, lira or gains in the lira, they forget about yields in Turkey, which are Astronomical. So on a total return basis, when you're investing in a place like Turkey, yeah, okay, the currency might be off 25, 30, 40 percent even on a given year, mm -hmm. but those yields should, in theory, compensate you for that. And we've seen a bit of that. I think on a total return basis, the lira is down this year, but not by as much as people would otherwise think. I think from an equity perspective, it's just one of these places where investors really struggle to put capital because there is such instability in the currency, because yields are all over the place. Uh, the capital generally tends to concentrate in areas of certainty on, in relative terms in the equity market, and that makes this area, this region of the world, really difficult to invest in, even though the economic trends could generally benefit this space. As you see deglobalization, you see diversified supply chains play out, some of Eastern Europe should be beneficial beneficiaries. But it's been really tough to attract capital, given that instability. Well, I mean, you're making a great point from the perspective of a foreign investor. But if you're a domestic investor inside of Turkey, yeah. there's no other place to go except yeah, the equity no market if you want to see, if you want to yeah. basically, yeah, if you want to invest. So, But I so, assume there, I mean, they must be using euros or dollars lira. rather I mean, than domestic, the lira. Yeah. It's so sad because it's such a beautiful country. I was lucky enough all to spend right. a month there when I was a kid with Kevin Charles Lawrence Morin, my English <laughs> professor who took us us all over for a great trip uh, to Roberts College and, and around the borders. So wow. um, tough time there, but at least they're getting a little bit of strength against the dollar today. It's been great hanging out with both of you today. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Gina Martin Adams and Damian Sassauer. Coming up on Bloomberg Television and Radio, Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley following last night's debate. This is Bloomberg.